kept by Helen Allen. If I must die, I will encounter darkness as a bride and hug it in mine arms. Shakespeare. Chapter 1 I hear a deep voice speaking, as though from a long, long way away. It's a man, and he sounds resigned, or frustrated, I'm not sure. Whoever did it confused the hunter with Josephine, I'm sure of it. No, Gerald, that makes no sense. Yes, I'm on my way there now. No, I don't know. I concentrate on figuring out where I am. The world still seems hazy, my head is killing me, and the goddamned bumping that seems to rattle my bones is non-stop. Slowly, frowning at the pain, I open my eyes. I'm finding it hard to focus. Everything seems to be foggy, squiggly, like right before the pain of a migraine hits. Only the pain's already hit, hard, and I'm not sure if it's more my head, my body, or my heart. Must everybody I care for die before this is all over? What I do know, though, pain aside, is that I'm on a train. And I also know it must be night, because a few feet away, his back to me, staring out the window at the darkness beyond, stands a brooding vampire. I'd know those shoulders anywhere, hadn't I spent weeks staring at them as I served him in the Parisian restaurant, and many subsequent weeks reluctantly dreaming about them, sans clothing. Now, though, this was no dream. It was a nightmare come true. Ah! I gasp as my thoughts begin to race and collide, and I gingerly raise my hand to my head. I expect to feel a broken skull, or maybe blood. The pain is so intense. After all, I'd tumbled forever down those fucking stairs. But my head is wrapped, and I can smell antiseptic. Bandages? Of course he would have tried to fix me. Can't have a broken kept. Isn't that what he said? He plans to keep me? At the same time as I recall his words, I remember what I'd seen earlier in the kitchen, right before my fall. Ricardo and Lucy, torn apart. Now, noticing I'm awake, the vampire turns to me, and I shudder, shrinking back onto the bed, willing it to swallow me up, to hide me from this monster. As he advances, I open my mouth to scream when another face, one I've never seen before, looms over me. She's coming around, the face says, my eyes still not quite able to focus properly to ascertain who's speaking. The melodic voice I know so well moves closer. Isn't it a bit soon? I squeak and try once more to disappear into the bed. She needs to rest and remain calm, the close face remonstrates. You might have to stay back. You said she would be fine when she woke. I expected her to remain unconscious for at least another day. The face frowns. Her skull has a tiny fracture. Any overexertion could cause bleeding on the brain. Sedate her, then. The face nods, and I feel a sharp prick in my arm. The world begins to swim, and my words slur. I want to shout, but they only come out as a whisper. You killed my friends. I see him turn back to me and frown. I think he's going to answer, but my eyes close, and I once again drift away. Chapter 2 Above me, brightly colored birds, roses, peonies, and lavender frame tiny nude, cavorting cherubs. Am I dead? I frown and concentrate harder. No, it's some kind of dome painting high above me. And the walls? No, it isn't walls. It's fabric with the same motifs, raw silk hanging in long folds and swaths. Four massive painted and carved posts hold up the dome, also featuring cherubs and flowers, and I can see I'm high off the floor. It's like I'm enclosed in a floating bower. I realize after a few moments that I'm lying in a highly decorated four-poster bed, the most elaborate bed I've ever seen one I couldn't have even imagined if I tried. Wincing, I try to sit up, but a gentle voice urges me to stay put. You have a broken collarbone, a quietly spoken man says, 
walking towards the bed and looking down at me with a friendly smile. And a concussion. A slight fracture to the skull. Oh, and bruises the entire length of your body. I frown and look down, realizing that under the rich brocade cover which matches the drapery perfectly, and the crisp white sheets beneath, I'm naked. My face flames at the thought that someone or several someones had undressed me while I was unconscious. The idea that it was Nicholas makes me cringe. Who are you? I demand, my voice coming out as a croaky whisper. The man smiles and reaches for a glass of water from a nearby side table. Leaning down, he places a hand behind my neck to enable me to take a few sips from the glass. I'm clumsy. The glass is at an awkward angle, and some water dribbles down my chin and onto the covers, staining the silk irrevocably. I'll have to see about getting you some straws, he smiles. You haven't answered my question, I frown, my voice now stronger, more like it should be. I apologize, he laughs gently. I'm Dr. O'Rourke, a friend of the family. He waves his hand around the opulent bedroom. Lord Montague called me when he found you hurt in Italy. Found, I mutter. That's an interesting take on events. Tell me, doctor, what was your diagnosis for my friends? What happened to them, do you think? I know my tone is acerbic, but I'm pushing to see how much this doctor knows and if he's in on kidnapping me. I'm afraid, if you mean the two people who perished in the fire, I believe their bodies were burnt beyond recognition. I understand they were friends of yours. I'm terribly sorry for your loss. Fire, I croak. Yes, that would do it. Now, he smiles, pulling up a chair. Let us talk of more pleasant things. You're heartily on the road to recovery, should you stay still and placid. He cocks his head to one side when he says this, indicating that's exactly what I need to do. And I anticipate you'll be able to walk around, albeit in a shoulder sling, within a few days. In fact, by tonight, when the sedatives have completely worn off, with aid, you may rise and attend to your ablutions. Ablutions? Toilet and shower, he smiles, pointing to the side of the room at a vast white oval bath sitting on a polished timber dais. It features a commanding view through wall-length windows of an extensive park, which seems to go on forever. I see in the corner of the room a toilet and bidet, and beyond, a clear glass shower recess with two large round shower heads. The entire bath section of the room is bigger than my apartment in Boston. I know where I am. I'm in Ariston Manor. Having peeked into quite a few bedrooms in this manor, and yet seen nothing on this scale, I'm fairly confident in my assumption that I've been installed in the state bedroom. I hope to hell this isn't also the preferred bedchamber of a certain bloodthirsty bastard known as Lord Nicholas Montague. What aid do you suggest I might have? I ask, my voice dull because I'm sure as eggs it's not going to be anyone who will also aid me in my escape. Nurse Orion is here to attend you when I leave, he smiles. She's Scottish, and a real card. Would you like me to call her in now? Sure, I sigh, leaning back in the pillows, my eyes glued to the window. I'm determined that the moment I can think straight, I'm going to throw one of the lovely antique day chairs currently pulled up to my bed, right through those panes, and shimmy myself the hell out of here. But no need to alarm the doctor. Still and placid is all he needs to think. Later that evening, having attended to my ablutions with the aid of my nurse, and having been helped to dress in a sheer white satin nightgown, the only choice I'm given, I broach the subject of my incarceration. Where are the clothes that I came in? I ask politely. I'd feel better dressed. I don't want to look like an invalid. Dear me, you look anything but, she laughs. This nightgown is lovely, so soft and pretty, and the little patterns, tiny fleur-de-lis all over it. They were even printed on the big white box it came in. Goodness, you have wonderful taste. No, dear, you don't look like an invalid. You look beautiful. I didn't choose this gown and I don't want to look beautiful, I mutter, 
deciding there was no harm in trying to beg for help. Nurse Orion, I'm a prisoner here. I want to leave. I want to go to a regular hospital. Ugh, you won't find better care than here, lassie, she says gently. And you're no prisoner. You're the special guest of Lord Nicholas Montague. I grimace. He's a vampire. I know you won't believe me, but he's a vampire and a murderer. He's killed my friends, and he's going to kill me. Ugh, but you've had a nasty bump on your noggin, she smiles benignly. Back into bed with you now. I sigh and do as I'm bid. Let's face it. If someone had talked to me of vampires a few months ago, I would have said they were brain damaged too. I wait until she leaves, hearing her turn the key in the lock, and I rise from the bed. I accept the fact that I can't escape through the window. I'm three floors up, and a broken collarbone precludes any sheet ropes or any other imaginative ways I might have come up with to free myself from this gilded cage. The nurse said it might take a few weeks of ice, pain relievers, rest, and physical therapy before my collarbone mends. Fortunately, it was not a bad break and hadn't required surgery. As for my head injury, I have headaches, the back of my neck hurts like a bitch, but other than that my mind's clear, and I'm going to need a hell of a lot more than physical therapy if Lord Montague gets his way with me. I try the door, but I heard right, it's locked. Morosely, I wander back to the bed to lie down, exhausted just from the effort of rising and dressing, and await whatever my vampire captor has in store for me. I'm in quite a bit more pain now. The painkillers haven't kicked in for the evening yet. The sun's beginning to sink below the horizon, and there's just a faint pink glow through the massive windows. As I notice this, my stress levels rise exponentially, as does the pain in my head, and my pulse begins to race. I know he'll come tonight, and I know I haven't got a hope of fighting him off if he tries to bite me. But I won't go down completely without a fight. I've secured the little scissors the nurse used to cut my fresh bandages and hidden them under my pillow. At the very least, I might injure him enough to allow me to run out the door and hide. Even as I think this, I know I'm fooling myself. Rather than exacerbating my headache by stressing any further, I sit and bite my nails and wish I had something to read to take my mind off the whole situation. But everything I owned is back in Sicily and if a fire had been lit in Ricardo's house to cover the evidence of his horrendous death, then all was lost. But I'm not lost. Because to be lost you have to have someone looking for you, wanting to find you, and I have no one. No one at all. As my thoughts begin to become more and more depressing, I turn my face into my pillow and cry. But I don't have long to wallow. The moment the sun sets, I hear the key turn in the door. He enters the room quietly, but his presence seems to fill the vast space, and looking up, I'm once again, reluctantly, struck by his beauty. Tonight's the first time I've seen him in anything but a suit, and the black skivvy he wears with tight blue jeans accentuate his broad shoulders and lean, muscular legs. If I didn't know him for what he is, if I wasn't so appalled at his murder of my friends, well, I'd have a hard time resisting someone this attractive. But I do know. Josephine. He smiles, walking close and pulling up one of the bedside chairs. How do you feel? I stare at him. Trapped would be my first answer. Terrified, a close second. A hundred retorts are on the tip of my tongue. A hundred forms of abuse just itching to fly out of my mouth and whip him with their spite. But as he watches me with his intense blue gaze, only one thing makes its way past my teeth. Why am I here? Why am I still alive? I brought you here, to my home, to protect you. You and I have very different definitions of protect, I spit. And I know this is not your home, so don't fool yourself that I believe you for a second. You hate this place. I think I see a slight twitch to the corner of his mouth when he hears this, but his eyes stay glued to mine. For some reason, though, as scared as I am that I might feel drawn to him like I was in the restaurant, once I meet his gaze, I don't. 
I wonder if the painkillers I'm on are blocking any hypnotic effect he might have on me. Or if it's just because my rose-colored glasses are gone, and I know the man in front of me is not Jacques Lumiere, playwright, but Nicolas Montague, vampire. What are you thinking? I'm thinking of stabbing you and making a run for it, even though I know I probably won't make it past the door. I wish, even as the words fly out of my mouth, that I could stop them. Your honesty. He shakes his head ruefully. It's one of the things I like so much about you. I have missed our restaurant conversations, Josephine. Why? How, might be more to the point. How is it that a young cook from the US, one that lives a criminal life, some might say, how is it that she intrigues me as no other has in centuries? His mention of my criminal life brings back memories of Blake, and anger shoots through me. You killed my boyfriend. You killed Blake. The young police officer. Yes. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He knew too much to be allowed to live. And Ricardo. I cry, my voice breaking at the memory of the chef's tortured expression. I don't wish to talk about that. Well, I do. You killed him, ripped him apart, and he, he knew nothing, nothing at all. He was just my boss, nothing more. He knew you. I hear the inflection in his tone. He means knew in the biblical sense. Is that what all the bloodshed is about? You're killing men I've slept with? Why? If that's the case, I can tell you there's a sports teacher in Illinois who deserves to be murdered more than Blake or Ricardo ever did. Yes, he did. What? I took care of him too. Oh my fucking God. Are you just going around killing everyone I've ever known? Is this your plan? To totally isolate me and destroy anyone I've known or loved before you pop my head off? He hurt you. He shrugs. I hurt him. Possibly a little more than necessary, but... You're a monster! I am a vampire, Josephine. And now what? Congratulations, you've killed everyone. I have no family. I have no friends. My only friend is already a vampire's suck-and-fuck doll. You may as well cut the crap and just kill me now, too. At the mention of Margarita, I see a slight frown cross his face, but he doesn't bite, figuratively or literally. It was not my plan to isolate you. I had planned to let you go. He shakes his head, as though even saying this out loud is antipathy to his soul. Circumstances change. He shrugs. I wish to keep you. I can tell you now, buddy. I hiss. That is not going to happen. I don't think you really understand what I'm offering. You will want for nothing. Every desire shall be satiated, every whim catered to. As long as I'm alive, I snort. Yes. No way. I like you, Josephine. I enjoyed talking to you each night at the restaurant. I looked forward to our discussions. Didn't you? I bite my tongue. I had looked forward to them. I liked him too. But that was when I thought he was someone else. A playwright, not a blood-sucking maniac. No. I don't think you're telling me the truth. You will want me, as I want you. He stands and walks towards the door. We too have something. I don't know what it is yet. It warrants exploration, but there is something. Did you poison my wine at the restaurant? Did you poison me already with your blood the same way Elsbeth made you her kept? Is that how you tracked me to Sicily? I'd been thinking this ever since I'd run from Paris, a fear in the back of my mind that I had not even wanted to admit to myself, or voice, lest it should be true. Do not mention that creature's name. He turns back to stare down at me darkly. And no, I would never do that. What? The man who kills for kicks has some scruples when it comes to coercing women to become his playthings? Surely not. I have never in five hundred years had to coerce a woman into my bed, Josephine. And I don't intend to start now. You will want me. You will beg me to take you. They all do, eventually. I've got news for you. I gasp, the exertion causing the pain in my head and shoulder to escalate off the Richter scale. 
and it's all bad. We'll talk later. Rest. Recover. You have had an ordeal. You caused that ordeal. I shout at his retreating back. I want to leave. I will never be your kept. Let me go. He says nothing, just closes the door quietly behind him, and I hear the heavy lock make a dull clunk as he turns the key. Chapter 3 My road to recovery, and consequently any chance of escape, is slower than anticipated. Thankfully, Nicholas hasn't bothered coming to terrify me for about a week, which has reduced my headaches immensely. My arm still hurts, a dull ache mostly at night. During the day, ice and medication keep the inflammation and much of the pain at bay. But it's not my arm that's bothering me today. It's my summons. You lucky girl, Nurse Orion says, opening the large lion, witch, and wardrobe doors fronting the walk-in robe at the end of the room and surveying the rows of gowns within. Getting up and about, dinner with the handsome lord, you must be excited. I watch her flick through the clothes hangers bearing, I don't know how many dozens of gowns, and wish this wardrobe led to another world. I'd jump straight through if it did. Which do you want to wear, Lassie? Red? Green? Black? White? My goodness, your clothes are beautiful. Once upon a time I had a figure that could have worn something like this, she says wistfully, pulling out a green floor-length Grecian cut number and holding it up to the light. I sigh. What I'd really like is a set of camouflage pants, a hoodie and an Uzi containing silver bullets. But I'm unlikely to find that inside the cavernous wardrobe which seems to only hold haute couture. Black, I pout. I'll wear nothing else while I'm in this prison. Dear me, she spins, frowning. I know you've had a terrible time of it, what with the fire and losing your friends, but it's time to snap out of it now and get back into the world. Now come on, dear, let's get you dressed. I reluctantly crawl out of the blankets and ease down onto the small timber steps that allow entry and egress from the monstrosity that is a state bed. Padding across to the wardrobe, I pull out one of several long black dresses. Christ, I'll look like Morticia Adams in this, I think, holding one up against me and looking at my reflection in the nearby Chevelle mirror. Fitting. That will set off your coloring beautifully, the nurse sighs. Ooh, and I almost forgot. The Lord sent you a present. She dashes to the sideboard and hurries back with a black velvet case, handing it over eagerly and watching with anticipation as I turn it over in my hands with suspicion. I've seen enough horror movies with Margarita to expect some kind of cursed piece of jewelry that will bind me to my vampire captor in some ridiculous way. Still, curiosity and the urging of the nurse prompt me to flick open the little gilt catch. I can't help but gasp when I see what he's sent, and I turn it to show the nurse before wordlessly handing it to her. No man had ever given me jewelry before, but then again, I snort and turn away. He isn't a man. Ooh, she says, smiling up at me, but getting no smile in return. You can have it, I murmur for caring so well for me. Take it. Wear it. Dunna be so silly, she says, slipping back into her hard-to-understand Scottish brogue. This necklace must be worth more than my house, lass. It's not a gift I could ever accept. I insist, I say, slipping out of my nightdress and easing my arm out of the sling to facilitate pouring myself into the black gown. It's short-sleeved, has a plunging neckline, and comes in tight at the waist with two little diamante clips on either hip, before flaring out into chiffon layers. At least, I think, studying the art deco shape of the clips, that they're diamantes. For all I know, given the sapphire and diamond extravaganza in the velvet box, they're real diamonds. I survey myself in the mirror. I can't wear a bra. The strap hurts my shoulder too much, but I don't need one in this dress. It's tight enough that it holds my boobs up with ease, and I'm not overly endowed, having only average to small breasts anyway. Besides, the underwear he's bought for me is hardly support wear. It's all frothy, lacy, and looks like something Victoria's secret models should be strutting on the catwalk. 
even the black lacy thong I'm wearing tonight contains the most material of any of the panties I could find in the drawer. And yet it's so flimsy, I may as well be going commando. You look lovely, Nurse Orion says, handing me a hairbrush. I brush, as instructed, but my hair feels gross from days on the pillow. I ask Nurse Orion to help me pull it into a bun at the base of my neck and leave it at that. Now that my face is losing its sun-tanned color and regaining the pallor it usually has, my blonde hair no longer suits me. I resolve to dye it black again when I escape. I don't have any makeup with me or perfume or deodorant, so I guess I'll just have to rely on the cool of the evening to stop me stinking up his dining room. As I think this, I smirk. He can suffer, keeping me locked up, killing my friends. The bastard. Just thinking about this makes my blood pressure rise, and I feel a headache coming on. I don't want to go, I say, staring at the nurse's face, reflected in the mirror. I have a headache. As if on cue, there's a knock on the door, and the nurse gives me a worried little smile before bustling over to open it. The butler, the same one who kicked me out of this place after finding Daniel and I in the Lord's Library, is waiting. He doesn't look pleased at all when he recognizes just who he's meant to escort to the dining hall. He nods at me, his mouth set in a grim line. I'm pretty sure, though, that my expression is much the same. Chapter 4 Toad in the hole, the butler announces, as the waitress puts the dish down carefully before me, whisks off the silver dome covering, and backs away. I can feel the butler's disapproval radiating off him, even if his face is neutral. He probably can't believe that the woman he caught trespassing in his lord's library is now someone he has to serve. I wonder if he knows I'm a prisoner, or if he would even care. How much does he actually know about the man at the other end of this vast timber dining table? I wait for him to leave, before raising my eyes to my captors where he sits, some fifteen meters away at the other end of the table dressed in an impeccable tuxedo. Between us are three candelabras, each with a dozen lit candles, and a large crystal bowl overflowing with pale pink roses. But even they don't feel like enough of a barrier for me tonight. He looks down at his meal, and up to me, his face neutral, eyes twinkling in the candlelight, and I scowl. I already know he eats real people food, as well as real people. I'd watched him eat every night at the restaurant when I served him. But I wonder now, as he picks up his fork, if he has to eat, or just likes to. Still, I'm not going to ask him. I'm not planning on keeping up any kind of conversation with a thing who's keeping me prisoner, no matter how gorgeous that thing is. Are your attendants looking after you well, Josephine? I nod, curtly. Do you want for anything? I make no reply. I mean, duh. I want to get the hell out of here. Are you planning on speaking to me tonight? I hear a faintly amused tone to his words as, studiously ignoring him, I frown down at the dish before me, my own fork dangling in my hand. Can we at the very least discuss our meal? He laughs gently. After all, you plan to be a chef, and I am somewhat of a gastronome. Over the meal we can share some common ground, surely. You look beautiful tonight, by the way. I scowl. Are you going to bite me tonight? Is this all some creepy prelude to you eating me? No. He shakes his head. When I said, discuss the meal, I meant what was on the plate before you. I sniff, not wanting him to see my relief, to see how worried I had been or scared I was of him. Why do you even eat food? Do you even need it? He considers my question, seemingly choosing his words carefully. I need to eat, yes, but less than a human man. I usually have an evening meal as a matter of ritual and... He pauses. I enjoy the cuisines of the sun. France, Italy, Spain. Perhaps because I can no longer walk under it myself. I'm struck by his honesty and the beauty of his words cuisines of the sun, and file this away for future use. 
but there is something else he eats that detracts from any sentiment I may feel at his terminology. And blood? I know you kill at least once a week. He shrugs and ignores my question, posing one of his own. What do you think of the meal before you? I frown down at my plate. I know we spoke about my wide palate when I served you in the restaurant, but even for me, toad is a stretch, I mutter. He laughs a low, rich chuckle. That isn't actually toad. What is it? Try it, you tell me. It's not, you know, the old lady from up the road, is it? Raucous laughter bursts out from him and echoes around the room, and even in candlelight, his eyes twinkle, making him look years younger. I remember, as he answers me, that he was only twenty-eight when he was turned. It's just his eyes, really, that usually make him seem older. No. I'm part of the raw food movement, so to speak. And I'd never serve you human flesh, Josephine, unless that was what you craved. As he says the last word, his eyes turn serious. You'd serve me human if I wanted it? I will give you everything and anything your heart desires. For as long as it beats, I murmur. Yes. I swallow hard. This conversation's heading in a direction I'd prefer it didn't. Looking down, I pick up my fork and prepare to dig into my meal. I'm relieved to find it's none other than sausage and gravy in a thick batter. He lets me eat in silence for a full ten minutes before asking what I think of the dish. Beef, I shrug, a little heavy and plain for my liking. It's a staple of this area, sometimes beef, sometimes pork sausages, but the batter remains much the same. However, I'm sensing that given you have barely touched the meals the butler has sent to your room this past week, you would prefer more a la carte dining. Of course, I shrug again. Although in truth, I'd eaten very little because the painkillers were suppressing my appetite. Usually I eat quite a lot for someone my size. Or would you prefer to cook it yourself? I hear amusement in his tone and look up. I understand you have already spent time in my kitchens. Ah, so the butler did tell him about me. Would you like to cook here, Josephine? I could hire a chef, a cordon bleu chef, as your personal trainer, so to speak, in all matters culinary. You want to keep me as your personal chef? I hear my voice rise an octave in surprise. For the time being. I think over what he's said. At least for the time being, my blood might be spared if I agree to this arrangement. Perhaps I can buy myself some time and escape. You would bring in a chef to train me? I raise my eyes to his. We've already established, Josephine, that I will do anything you desire. No, I frown, my tone belligerent. We have established that will be the case if I agree to be kept, which I have not and will never agree to. What I desire now is to be set free. He shrugs. Let us consider this a peace offering. Live with me, get to know me, and I'll bring in a chef on Monday. If he's unsuitable, I'll replace him. Replace or replace, I sneer, my inference obvious. I may kill him. He shrugs. But that is my prerogative, Josephine. After all, a man must eat. His words inflame me, and I shake my head at my own stupidity, almost falling for his guile. He knows I love cooking, and has simply used that to try and coerce me into accepting my captivity, and I almost fell for it. How stupid does he think I am? Stupid, stupid, stupid. You are not a man, I growl. You are a monster, a murderer of people with far less strength and speed than you, which makes you a coward and a psychopath. He scowls at me. That makes two of us. Every time you order beef at a restaurant, you're complicit in the murder of a cow, a creature with far less strength and speed than you. How do you reconcile that, Josephine? I scowl back. Hadn't I had this very conversation with myself on several occasions since I'd discovered his journals? I was starting to believe vegetarianism might be the only way forward if this conversation was followed to its logical conclusion. You may be right, I shrug trying to calm down and taking a sip of my water. 
but cows can't talk. He smirks. They simply can't talk our language. They do talk to one another. I breathe out deeply. Of course, there is one big difference between what I want to do with my food and what he wants to do with his, or more specifically, me. I don't want to fuck a cow. He growls. And, I press, I don't understand why vampires only sleep with their kept. If it's sex you want, just screw me. Get it over with and let me be on my way. You think you understand because of the small amount you've read in my journals, but you comprehend nothing. Then enlighten me, I shout, throwing down my fork, all pretense at civility gone. Tell me what it is I'm apparently ignorant of. What is it I don't know that will suddenly make me want to sacrifice my life to you? I can see I've angered him, but he keeps his voice even. When a vampire offers to share his life with a human, he's giving up his secrets. The kept is giving up their independence to a degree, but gaining, oh, so much more. He lowers his voice, his tone becoming seductive. We trade blood, Josephine. The vampire ties themselves, binds themselves to their chosen kept. We feel all your emotions. We know where you are at any given time. We protect you with our lives and you. You sustain ours with your blood. Can you imagine, beautiful girl, how wonderful it is to make love with a man who knows exactly how you're feeling at all times? You're trying to make it sound romantic. I shake my head in disgust. But you don't make love. The bottom line is you suck and fuck a woman until she begins to care for you, and then you kill her. But until then, that woman receives the vampire's utmost attention. We want our kept happy healthy, content. Vampires as old and rich as I can ensure their companions want for nothing. Our blood gives the gift of health. No sickness, no accident. Nothing can kill you or harm you when you become kept. Except you, the keeper. The master, yes. He shrugs. You want me to call you master? No, of course not. But that is the reality of the relationship, Josephine. I am simply being honest with you. Why do you even bother? I shake my head from side to side and roll my eyes. You're a handsome man. Your eyes hypnotize or something. Any woman would be happy to let you into her bed. Hell, they might not even mind if you suck their blood. Why bother binding someone to you? He sighs. Did you believe vampires really existed before me, Josephine? Before all this? He waves his hand around the room. No. Then put two and two together. You're not senseless. My kind live in secrecy. We hunt, we kill, we feed on humans. I screw up my nose and shake my head. So what? So when we have sex, when we bite, we're opening our secrets to a human, a person who may or may not reveal that secret when the tryst, relationship, one night stand, whatever circumstance in which sexual contact occurred, ends. And no, I can't hypnotize women. I'm handsome, my smell attracts, as does no doubt my wealth. I draw people to me. I have some other small skills. He shrugs, and I can see he's hiding something. But he smooths over this quickly. But I cannot simply beguile women into my bed or into giving blood. And I cannot erase their memory of me. Only a kept would keep my secret. So you can't have sex without biting? He pauses, considering my question carefully. No. But sex with a vampire is not something a woman would ever forget, or ever get enough of, biting or no biting. I stare at him. Frankly, he's the most striking man I've ever met. And in my dreams, regardless of the fact he is a blood-sucking freak, he's a star attraction between the sheets. I blush as I think about what it must be like sharing his bed. Swallowing hard, I take a long sip of my wine as he watches me, a faint smile on his face. Get a grip, girl. He's a killer. But eventually you kill your partners. You enjoy killing. Oh, yes. But, Josephine, if you're so concerned about saving the human race from my predation, then being kept is something you should consider. After all, if I feed a little from you daily, 
I don't need to hunt as often. I sip my drink. I'd pretty much figured this out for myself already. I just wanted to hear him confirm it. You only take a kept every 30 years. Why now? Why me? He sighs. I only marry a kept every 30 years to ensure my lineage continues to be perceived as carrying on, but I take a temporary kept for company when the mood strikes me. I'm not a celibate or a monk. I have the same needs as any man. As for why you? I like you, Josephine. Is that so very hard to believe? I enjoy your conversation. I desire your body. I want to keep you. I frown. No man had ever told me he desired me before. Sure, they'd shown it with their eyes or their actions, but to actually say, I desire you, that's a first, and frankly, a bit of a turn-on. Still, I have to remind myself, he's not a man, he's a monster. I already know you're a vampire, I frown. I won't reveal your secret. I gave back your journals. Just let me go. Let me live my life. I'm afraid I can't do that. I grit my teeth, my head starting to really pound now. I want to scream, but I also want to find a way to escape. I know I need to accept his offer to cook for him if I'm to gain any opportunity to run. Okay, I would like a chef, but I don't want you to eat anyone just because I don't work well with them. And I don't want you to think this means I'm in any way happy to be held prisoner or even in your wildest fantasies believe I'll warm to you and become your kept. He smirks and raises his glass. How will you find someone? I have my ways. I could interview chefs for the position? I know my voice sounds hopeful, and I'm trying very hard to keep it neutral, but he sees right through me. I don't think that would be a good idea. I don't even argue. We both know I would have used the interviews as a means of trying to escape. At the very least, I would have slipped one of the interviewees a note for the police, or for James. It's occurred to me that perhaps he's still out there, looking for this vampire. And maybe, just maybe, he and his hunter buddies could rescue me. And I don't care if the vampire thinks he can read me like a book, thinks he can see through my plans. Because if he allows me to cook, that means I'll be out of my room. And that means I'll have other opportunities for escape because the kitchen wasn't the only room I'd spent a fair bit of time in when I was in the manor previously. And if the germ of an idea that's forming in my head works, I may not need rescuing. Are you ready for dessert? He nods at my barely touched plate. No, I want to go to bed. He looks disappointed but doesn't press the issue. Instead, he rises and walks the distance to the other end of the table where I sit. I flinch as he walks behind me and pulls out my chair, his hands brushing across the back of my neck like a breeze. So lightly I could almost have imagined it. Standing I move to leave, but he places one hand on my forearm. Holding my breath, I turn back to him as he leans forward and takes my hand. Pressing his lips to it, he raises his dazzling eyes to mine, and I realize they're the exact blue of the sapphires in the necklace that somehow, is now around my neck. Sleep well, Josephine. He breathes out heavily, and I get a lungful of his heavenly breath as I pull my hand from his, and nod. My head is still spinning as I walk down the hallway, and I shake it to clear away the fuzziness as I hear his faint laughter echoing behind me. But I do sleep well that night, better than I had so far during my captivity. Chapter 5 Cooking in a long gown that's probably worth more than the average family car, I ignore the butler's constant disapproving scowl and finish plating the meal. My chef private tutor has yet to arrive. Nicholas told me he's on his way but hasn't revealed his identity. So, for now, I cook alone, albeit under the scrutiny of the butler, who flat out refuses to talk to me, unless giving me an order. Tonight? To honor Ricardo and remind Nicholas that I continue to hold a grudge and will never forgive him for what he did in Sicily, I once again cook Italian. In fact, I smirk. I'll continue to cook Italian every night until I escape. This evening I've made a roasted red capsicum spread with Parmesan polenta for entree and spaghettini al sugo crudo for main, 
a sauce I learned from Ricardo. I'm using my mother's handmade pasta recipe, which even Ricardo, a Sicilian, had to concede was on par with his own. For dessert, I'm making an Anglo-Italian trifle, a little of my own recipe, a little of Ricardo's. I wish I could add his recipes to the bottom of my mother's cookbooks, but I have to rely on memory now, because I no longer have her books. Luckily, I'd made this pasta many, many times even before I visited Sicily, so I have it down pat, and Ricardo's recipe is very simple and easy to remember. Thinking of my mother, and of Ricardo, and knowing they live on through their recipes, gladdens my heart. And so does being able to leave the confines of my room and surround myself with the familiar, with the smells and comfort of a kitchen. Cooking has lightened my mood considerably during the day. I could sometimes forget I was a prisoner, pretend I was a private chef to a billionaire. Only the night brought with it the truth. Tonight, like every other night for the past two weeks, I'll dine with Nicholas in the great dining hall. Every evening he watches me eat, tries to engage me in conversation, tries to convince me to say the words that will bind me to him and allow him to drink from me and sleep with me. But I will not. Now that I know he wants me to come willingly, I have power, and I'm sure as hell not going to hand that over on a silver platter. Not when I've come up with a way to escape. But for now, for tonight at least, I'll pretend all is well. This is delicious, Josephine. You have great talent in the kitchen, and elsewhere, I'm sure. I miss my mother's cookbooks, I say quietly, not raising my eyes to his. Most nights I try to say very little. I don't want to give him any indication that I'm in the slightest way happy about being kidnapped and held prisoner. Because I'm not. Tonight, it's even more important than ever to keep his mind on the mundane, in case I let slip in some unknown way that I'm hiding a secret. A plan. Yes, but you know, the best chefs are those that experiment, those that try new things, rather than sticking to a recipe. You may have freed yourself from constraints you didn't know you were working under. They were all I had left of my mother, I say quietly, tears close to the surface. If they were constraints, I loved them. I needed them. Now I have nothing. I don't look up at him, don't want him to see my eyes are glistening. Instead, I ignore the sound of him rising from his seat as I reach for my water, taking a deep gulp. He walks to the sideboard and opens a drawer. Still struggling to control my emotions, I look up as he comes to stand by my chair. In his hands are my mother's books and the complete works of William Shakespeare, the latter I'd carried with me since the Camden markets. You saved them, I croak, tears now welling unbidden. You saved my mother's books. I know what they mean to you, Josephine. Of course I saved them. But even had I not, you would not have had nothing. You have me. I shake my head, lost for words, as he hands them to me and walks back to his seat at the other end of the very, very long table. Drying my tears on my linen napkin, I place my hand upon the books, feeling their familiar smooth covers. How could someone so bloodthirsty also be so thoughtful? Why did you kill Ricardo? I ask him quietly. You let me go from Paris. I know you did. Were you just playing a sick cat and mouse game with me like Lucy said you might? Did you plan to find me and terrify me again and again until I cracked? What was it all about? What is this? I wave my hand around the room, from the walls and their imposing masterpieces to the fireplace with its crackling flames, and back to him. What is this all about? He's silent for several minutes, and I pull back my chair, ready to stand, sure he isn't going to answer. But he surprises me. I didn't kill them. What? I didn't kill Ricardo and Miss Burnshire. He holds up his hand to stall my questions. Don't get me wrong. I fully intended to kill Miss Burnshire. In fact, I had tracked her to Sicily for that very purpose. I was more surprised than anyone to find her in the same home as you. But she was dead when I got there, Josephine, and so was your lover. I don't believe you, I say, 
my voice barely a whisper. He shrugs. It's the truth. I stand, quietly, considering him. I'll give him one thing. He's never lied to me. In fact, he's been painfully truthful about everything he wants and all the consequences that come with it. But how can I trust a man who's holding me captive? As if reading my mind, he stands too. I have no reason to lie, Josephine. If I killed them, I would admit it, as I have done freely to you in the past. Keeping you here while I find out who did murder them is keeping you safe, although, you know I wish to keep you for other reasons, and you'd certainly be safer if you agreed to be mine. I swallow hard. He'd elucidated those reasons on many, many occasions. He desired me. He liked me. He wanted to give me pleasure I'd only ever dreamed of. Most of me was sick of hearing it. But a small part, a very small part that only reared its ugly little head in the darkest hours of the night, wondered what it would be like. How freeing would it be to give in to my desire for him, to allow him to own me, keep me, to never have to worry about money or the future, because that would be all taken care of. But I also knew, in my heart of hearts, this was something I would never do. I wanted to live. I wanted a family of my own one day. Children. I wanted a future. And no amount of billionaire lifestyle days or earth-shattering nights would make up for having that taken away from me. I'm going to bed. Thank you for the books. I turn to leave, but he's in front of me, quicker than I could have imagined anyone or anything moving, and I gasp. I know what's coming. He'll kiss my hand, breathe on me, wish me good night. Only tonight he doesn't. He takes the books from me and carefully places them on the table behind us, before turning to me and putting his hands on my shoulders. My cast is off now. My shoulder twinges occasionally. But I'm no longer in pain, no longer on medication, so the careful weight of his hands is not causing me any discomfort. But I stand stiffly, uncomfortable in his proximity, wanting to lean away from him, and yet not, drawn but repelled at the same time. Look at me, Josephine. Unwillingly, I raise my eyes to his and become lost. His are so deep it's like looking into two bottomless wells. I could drown in the blue. They're so beautiful. And as his eyes seem to burn into mine, to consume them, he commands, Come. I frown and then gasp. My hands fly to his arms, and my fingers dig into his biceps as I'm rocked by a powerful orgasm, my body tingling from head to toe. I can't look away from his eyes as I'm gripped by paroxysms of pleasure that go on and on as he watches intently, bringing me to a shuddering and stunned conclusion. Panting, staring at him in amazement, I see him smirk. If I can do that with my voice, Josephine, just imagine what I can do with my body. Every part of me is suddenly fueled with anger. Stepping back from him, I jerk my arm back and slap him across his smirking face with all my strength. The sound of my palm smacking against his cheek echoes around the vast room like a gunshot. Don't you ever, I hiss, ever do anything like that to me again. Turning on my heels, I run headlong out the door and down the length of the hall, past the faces of all the previous Mrs. Montagues and their judgmental eyes my footsteps sounding like the pitter-patter of rain on a tin roof. Finally, several halls later, I reach my bedroom, and throwing open the door, launch myself at the bed, flinging myself upon it and bawling my eyes out, great racking sobs of despair and fear and self-loathing. But when I'm finally all cried out, I'm also resolved. Tomorrow I'll escape. Rising and splashing water on my face, I stare at my reflection in the mirror for a full five minutes and collect myself, before gritting my teeth and preparing for the reconnaissance I had planned for this evening, creeping from my room wearing a black velvet Yves Saint Laurent gown that I've hacked at the knees. I follow the hallway past my door as far as it will go, before making a sharp right down the long corridor towards the armory. I know of a secret door, an unlocked door, 
in an older section of the manor that I figured he rarely if ever visited. The armory contains a range of armor, but also weapons, stuffed animals, curiosities from a range of cultures ancient and more modern, and a doorway that leads out into the field on the eastern side of the manor. And from there, I hope to escape. But not tonight. I'm not stupid. I plan to wait until tomorrow when he's in his crypt or whatever the hell he sleeps in during the day, and then I'll run. I test the door to make sure it's still unlocked and turn, quietly, to make my way back to my room. I wish I had my phone, any phone actually, any way to contact the outside world, but I'd scoured every unlocked room over the past few weeks. Nothing. And who would I call anyway? Daniel? No, I wouldn't want him to end up dead. It had to be James. He was the only living person who would understand my predicament and was prepared to kill a vampire. Especially now Lucy had been decapitated. Surely he'd be even more motivated to destroy Nicholas. But I don't have his phone number. I have no idea where he is. Perhaps if I write a letter and address it to the school, it'll find its way to him either directly or forwarded. I can only hope. I'm still chewing my way through this contemplation when I get to my room and undress, deciding a bath might be the most relaxing option before my big day tomorrow. There's only one light on in the room, a small bedside lamp made of multifaceted stained glass, and I leave that on until the bath is full, before switching it off too, and plunging the room into darkness. Walking to the bath, I sink into the inky, scented water and turn my head to stare out the window at the moon and stars, the landscape below, my eyes adjusting slowly. At first, it looks like empty fields, just as it had in daylight, trees way in the distance. But beyond the trees, perhaps three or four kilometers away, or maybe more, the lights of the village glow softly on the horizon. If I can make it through the forest, I can make it to the village, I whisper. Closing my eyes, I lean my head back and try to relax, but my shoulder aches tonight, possibly due to the force I applied to Nicholas's face, and my headache, never far away, is returning. Sighing, I decide to rise and, pulling the plug with my toe, I stand, trying to remember where I left my towel. But as I cast my eyes around the room, a movement out of the corner of my eye draws my attention, and I look to the window just in time to see someone, or something, flit away. Was it my imagination? Did I just see a face at the window? Gasping, I run to the window and look out, and down, but there's nothing. I'm three floors up. Can he turn into a bat? Can he fly? God, fuck, tell me no, I moan. Turning, I make my way to the small ornate writing desk near the door and wedge the matching chair under the door handle, just to feel more secure. Chewing my lip, I dry myself, dress in my hacked black dress once more, and hop into bed. Too wired to sleep, I switch on the bedside light and pen my letter to James, then move on to write my recipe for Ricardo's sauce underneath my mother's pasta recipe. I use blue pen to distinguish my notes from hers, our handwriting is otherwise, very similar. Smiling at the thought that one day I might have a daughter who will read recipes from both her mother and grandmother, I resolve to dream sweet dreams of a future filled with love and laughter, a future far, far away from here. But my dreams are full of blue eyes, sharp teeth, and a handsome man holding me, saying, come, and when I wake, I'm not rested. Chapter 6 Easing open the armory door, I take one last look at the array of stuffed animals and their glassy, dead stares and shake my head. The two baby bears that stand either side of the doorway look back at me, I think, sadly, and I momentarily wonder what kind of fucked-up person shoots and stuffs baby bears. But I know exactly what kind, I murmur, shaking my head. Wish me luck, Paddington. Scooting through, I carefully close the door behind me and lean on it, surveying everything around me. The fields are empty. 
I can hear a motorbike in the distance, and lawnmowers. But the side of the manor I have found myself on is hidden in deep shade at the moment, so I know no one will notice me. I shudder at that thought, but shake my head. I'd put enough sedatives into the butler's tea to ensure he slept for a month. There was no one else watching me. I scoot along, my back pressed flat against the brickwork, to the corner of the building, the side facing the forest, and eye the distance between the manor and the woods speculatively. Once I'm in the tree line, I know I just have to keep walking east, and I'll eventually reach the village. I can only foresee three problems. Number one, I'm barefoot. There was no way I could wear the high heels supplied with the wardrobe full of gowns on a trek like this. Try as I might, I'd been unable to break off the heels to turn them into flat sandals. I'd ventured during my attempts that Margarita had sent an invisible shoe protection fairy to save their lives. Number two, I'm not terrific with direction. There's a possibility I'll get lost once I'm in the woods. Number three, I have to get to safety, to human civilization, before sunset. Ignoring all three issues, I bite my lip as I stare at the trees in the distance and hunch down, ready for my flight. I'd been torn about running or walking, worried that if I ran, I might draw attention, unsure if Nicholas has security or anyone else that might question who I was and what I was doing on his land. My plan, at least five minutes ago while talking to the bears, was to walk casually across the field and enter the woods. Now, though, with adrenaline shooting through my veins and fear fueling me, I know I'm going to run. Without further pause, I sprint away from the manor and head in a direct line for the forest. As I run, I hear the motorbike I'd noticed earlier. Its engine appears to be getting louder, perhaps coming closer, but I can't run any faster than I am, so I continue to aim straight for the trees. I'm not puffed yet, not by a long shot, and I'm just starting to feel confident I'll make it. When a dog looms in front of me, a large dog, a large, red, hairy dog. Before I can stop myself, I trip right over the mongrel as it yips in pain and I tumble, headlong onto the grass, winding myself terribly. Moaning and gasping, I roll onto my stomach and push myself onto all fours, but I still can't seem to get enough air into my lungs, and I wheeze and gulp uncontrollably. The sound of the motorbike cuts out, and the dog appears by my side, tail wagging, happy, vacant eyes shining, and licks my face from chin to hairline. Ugh, I moan, turning my head away and clutching my chest as I struggle to my knees, sucking in great gulps of air. You all right, lass? A man asks, his big, booted feet the only thing I'm able to focus on at this point. I reluctantly look up. The man's tall, a giant from where I kneel, his shadow blocking out the sun. Behind him is a four-wheel motorbike with a big, flat, low-sided cage on the back, holding a small black deer. I've never seen a black deer before, and I'm momentarily transfixed. It's beautiful, and I imagine when it's grazing in the dappled light of the forest, its color makes it look just like a shadow. But I refocus quickly. Today is not a field trip. I'm, uh, I'm fine. I managed to squeak, accepting his proffered hand and rising on unsteady legs. My knees are green and badly scraped, bleeding a little from the fall. My shoulder has a dull ache, and my headache is back. But other than that, I know I can continue on. But part of me also knows this man isn't likely to let that happen. He obviously works here and will want to know who I am. I'll have to bluff my way out of this. And perhaps, just perhaps, my honed acting skills from numerous restaurant heists will see me through. I hold out my hand to him. He looks to be about forty-ish, heavy-set, although muscular rather than fat. His hair is crew-cut, and he's dressed in dark green pants and a cream-colored hunting jacket, complete with all the little pockets and zips they all come with. I wonder briefly, as I always do when I see these jackets, what men could possibly put in so many tiny pockets. You must be the... Gamekeeper, he fills in for me, shaking my hand firmly. 
I try not to wince, his hands strong, and my shoulder hurts. Of course. Well, great. Thanks for your help. I hope I didn't hurt your dog. Not at all. Sally's a great galoof. He smiles, shaking his head. Red Setter. The worst kind of dog for a gamekeeper, really. Dumb blonde of the dog world. No offense. He adds quickly. She's lovely. I nod, giving her a quick pat as she looks up at me, adoringly. Anyhow, I'll just be on my way. I start to walk past him, head high, ignoring the dog cavorting happily around my legs. Hang on now, he says, causing me to stop in my tracks. It's Miss Bailey, isn't it? Oh, shit. I turn and put on my friendliest smile, aware, though, that I'm in a dress hacked off at the knee, none too carefully. I'm barefoot, said knees are bloody, and I'm clearly trying to get away as fast as I can. Yes, I nod, but call me Josephine, please. A tight smile on my face, I turn back for the woods, not halting my stride as he begins to walk beside me. The woods are no place for a walk at this time of year, not in bare feet, that's for sure. Autumn makes some of the ground plain muddy and nasty, not to mention the weather report says rain is likely today. You'd best be going back inside. Oh, I'm just going for a short walk, I reply sunnily. I won't go far. Ms. Bailey. He halts me with a hand on my arm. I'm afraid I must insist you go back inside. My instructions are to ensure you don't leave the premises. But I'm not leaving the estate, I say innocently, my eyes wide. No, but... He looks uncomfortable. You need to go inside. I decide, as close as I am to the woods, I will not return to that manor come hell or high water. Turning to him, I grip his arms, my eyes now wide and desperate. But I'm a prisoner. He's a vampire. A murderer. I see his expression darken at my hysterical ranting, and try another angle before all is lost. If you believe nothing else, Believe I don't want to be here. I'm being kept against my will. His lordship said you'd had a nasty bump on the head. I've seen it before, in my time in the army. It will come right, lass. Don't worry about that. But for now, you need to get back to the manor. For Christ's sake, I shake my head and growl. How many people has he told I'm brain damaged? You're not well, he says gently. Panic sets in. I realize he'll report back to Nicholas that I left the manor, and all exits will likely be blocked to me in the future. This is my only chance. Stealing myself and clenching my jaw, I decide instantaneously to make a run for it. Shoving him hard in the chest, I knock him backwards and shoot towards the nearby woods. Swearing he lunges after me, but just misses, his fingers literally brushing my hair. I run, full tilt, harder and faster than I've ever run before. My wheezing breaths sound like tiny screams of fear as I imagine the man right behind me. But he's not. Rather than pursue me on foot, I hear him start his motorbike, just as I reach the trees. Panting like a woman in labor, I dodge around trees and shrubs and head in the general direction I know Ariston Village to be, vaguely east where I'd seen lights on the horizon through my massive bedroom windows. As I run deeper into the forest, where the trees and underbrush are thicker, it slows me down. But I'm also aware that the sound of the bike is retreating. I hope to God the gamekeeper has given up and returned to the manor where, fingers crossed, I won't be pursued until the sun sets. Slowing down to a fast walk to catch my breath, the motorbike now way in the distance, I try to take my bearings, but the woods are so deep, and even though the trees are in autumn foliage, they're blocking much of the sunlight, and I have no innate sense of direction. Jesus, fuck, I hope I'm not running in circles, I whisper as I set off once more at a jog. Slowing only to push myself, here and there, through thick underbrush, ease my feet out of muddy bogs, or clamber and scramble over logs, I continue for what seems like several hours before I finally notice the woods are thinning. Late afternoon, 
I abruptly find the trees end in bright sunlight and a small bitumen road. It hasn't rained, as the gamekeeper predicted, although many times over the past day I wished it would. I'm so thirsty and flushed. I'd kill for a drink. As I think this, it comes to mind that this is exactly what Nicholas does, and I remind myself I need to hurry. Standing in the tree line, I look left and right to ensure no one's around, before stepping out onto the road. I have no idea which direction to take, but I know I only have an hour or two before the sun sets, and my heart begins to beat faster at the thought of Nicholas's anger, and his possibly imaginative retribution when he discovers I've run away. Images of Kathy Bates and having my legs broken swim before my eyes, and panic begins to grip my chest. Which way? Far out. Which way? I whisper as I stand on the road, chewing my lip and clawing my wayward hair out of my eyes. Back, lass, a deep voice says. I shriek and spin around. In the trees not twenty meters further down from where I emerged is the gamekeeper, gun slung across his shoulder, dog at his feet. Stop chasing me, I scream, turning to run down the road away from him, no longer caring where it leads, as long as it's away from him and his boss. I hear the motorbike start, and I begin to sob as it gains fast and then idles behind me, keeping up, but not trying to run me down or pass. This road goes for forty miles, the gamekeeper shouts over the noise of the engine. I ignore him and continue to jog, my heart's pounding, my lungs feel like I'm breathing fire, my feet are blistered and bleeding from half a million splinters and cuts. But I keep going, one foot in front of the other praying a car will come past and rescue me. Twenty minutes pass, I'm slowing, but still running, and the motorbike is still idling along behind me. You've been running all day. Give it up, lass, the deep voice says again. I glance to my side and see his dog, the big, floppy red setter, grinning and running along as though it's having the time of its life. And I know. I have nothing more to give. I've had no water all day, my legs feel like they're made of jelly, and my face feels so hot it might explode. I know I can't go on and sobbing, finally spent. I collapse and fall to the grass by the roadside and give in to my disappointment and disgust at my own weakness. The engine stops. I hear heavy footfalls, but I don't struggle as strong hands pull me up from the grass and carry me to the bike lying me across the back in the carrier where earlier I'd seen the fawn. Without speaking, the gamekeeper whistles for his dog and turns the bike around, heading back to Ariston. I say nothing, but continue to cry quietly for much of the bumpy journey. When we finally pull up to the front steps of Ariston, I scramble out of the carrier, rise on weak legs, and turn to my captor. Wiping swollen eyes, I raise them to him in one last pleading attempt at salvation. Will you at least post a letter for me? Is that too much to ask? Now that, I can do, he says, taking the letter I withdraw from my pocket and hold out to him with a trembling hand. I don't have any stamps on it, I add apologetically. Never you mind, he says. I'm going into Ariston Village in the morning. I'll send it off for you. Now be a good girl and go back inside. Shoulders slumped, I nod and walk up the wide steps to where the butler is waiting, door open, face impassive. His lordship wishes to see you in his study, he says in his low monotone. His lordship can fuck off, I mutter, dragging my sore legs up three more wide, winding staircases and along two long, torturous corridors to my bedroom. Staggering to my bedside table, I pour myself three glasses of water from the crystal jug, one after the other, and down them, glug, 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 not spilling a precious drop, before spinning towards the bathtub and lowering myself in, dress and all. My body's so sore, so completely spent, I can't even rise to reach the taps, and instead, flick them on with my toes. Lying fully clothed, the water gradually rising, I stare at the ceiling and send my will, every tiny bit of it, into the universe, begging it, 
pushing it, forcing it, to have my letter delivered, and have James find me. The universe will provide, I whisper to the ceiling. It always does. No sooner have I said this, though, than there's a short, sharp rap on my door, and Nicholas strides in, his face a thundercloud. I watch from the bath, only my head visible above the line of the porcelain and wait for him to discover me. As his eyes meet mine, and he marches angrily towards the bath, I sink lower down into the water, but raise my chin resolutely, waiting for whatever chastisement or punishment he plans to impose. I meet his gaze steadily, but taking in my expression, I see his eyes soften. You've been outside? Yes. You tried to run away? Yes. My gamekeeper is ex-military. It was unwise. I shrug. Did he hurt you? He didn't shoot me, I mutter. Have I ever hurt you? I nod. Physically? I reluctantly shake my head. Then why? He reaches down and rubs his thumb gently against my cheek, along the tracks my tears have left on my as yet unwashed face. I say nothing. There's no point. He knows why. He sighs and sits on the edge of the bath, frowning when he notices my feet and running his eyes over the rest of me, taking in that I'm still in my black dress, hacked at the knee and now torn and wrecked from hours spent crawling and pushing through undergrowth. You didn't like the dress? His lips just turn up slightly at the corners, as though he wants to smile, but knows given my expression, it might just push me into hysteria. I hate all the clothes you've bought me, I mutter, sinking my mouth under the water and telling myself, firmly, not to engage further with him. Oh? He raises his eyebrows, clearly surprised. I thought only to please you. They are all of the highest quality. You like high-quality food. I expected you would like only the best fashion. I raise my mouth from the waterline and mutter with my lips half in, half out, so it sounds all bubbly. You don't know me at all. Then enlighten me, Josephine. I want to get to know you. Tell me what you like, what you dislike. I like jeans and t-shirts. I frown at him, angry now, my melancholy slipping away in the face of my ire. I dislike being held prisoner. He sighs and shakes his head ruefully. I thought you wore such things due to your poverty, not because you liked them. I wasn't poor, I snort. I was focused. I spent my money on ingredients to pursue my dream. I don't care about clothes I never have. Margarita is the clothes horse, or was before she became a zombie. Ingredients. Rising, he walks towards my wardrobe opening the doors and shaking his head at all the gowns hanging, most still in their zip bags bearing designer names, row after row. He turns and strolls back to the bath, looking down at me, concerned. And apart from your clothes, what else do you wish for here while you are my guest? Guest? I snigger. I want deodorant, makeup, a hairdresser, a television, a wooden stake, and oh yeah, my freedom. He smiles and walks to the door. I have a surprise for you when you're finished bathing. Will you join me for dinner? You can shove dinner where the sun doesn't shine. I spit, narrowing my eyes at him. Let's say nine. He smirks. That gives you almost three hours to become presentable and amiable. I'll send for the nurse to attend to your feet. I growl and, grabbing the nearest thing, hurl a small bottle of liquid soap at his head just as he ducks through the door, and it smashes against the doorframe, sending slippery liquid all over the wallpaper and floor. I'll give you amiable, I shout angrily, slipping back under the water. Chapter 7 I stand in his study and frown, hands on hips. I hadn't attended dinner with him last night after my failed escape attempt, because by the time I got out of the bath and into bed, I was so exhausted I'd laid down and slept like the dead. Or at least, I imagine that's how they sleep. I've never asked. Now, 
smirking at me as though he has some lovely secret that he refuses to share. He sits on the edge of his desk and watches me. Well, what's the surprise? I'm sorry you couldn't join me for dinner, but I understand you were exhausted. Yes, but I don't appreciate you hovering outside my window, perving on me. I beg your pardon? You heard. That's twice now I've seen your face at the window while I've been getting out of the bath. If you're so dead keen on seeing me naked, just say so. He frowns. I can assure you, Josephine. I definitely do want to see you naked, but... He holds up his hand to forestall my abuse. I am not in the habit of lurking outside ladies' windows. I might also remind you that your room is three stories up. I know that. I frown. I thought maybe you could fly. His laughter echoes around the room. Well, I throw my hands into the air. You make people come with a word and pop heads off like corks. Who the hell knows what you're capable of? When he's finally finished laughing, he shakes his head at me. I can't fly. If you're sure you saw something at your window, it was most likely an owl. We have rather large barn owls here. They have big, round, white faces and large eyes. Perhaps that's what you saw. I don't think so, I frown. He cocks his head to one side and considers me momentarily, before switching the subject. Are you the only woman on earth who is not excited when a man says he has a surprise for her? I shrug. I'm here, aren't I? Yes. Try to contain your enthusiasm. I roll my eyes. All right. What is it? I have a chef for you. Here? Of course. But if I can't work with him or her, you're not going to... I pause and hold up two fingers, curled in front of my lips to symbolize fangs. You know? Seeing my expression, he bursts out laughing again, a mirthful, infectious sound that bounces around the room. I imagine this ominous room hasn't seen much laughter in its long history. Recovering, he shakes his head. No, I'm not going to. He bares his fangs and grins. I frown and shrink back, wiping the grin from his face. I've never seen his fangs before, and now that I do, Every atom in my body is screaming. Run. Does this frighten you? He tucks his fangs slightly behind his lips. Yes. I assure you I would never hurt you, Josephine. When I bite, you will only feel pleasure. I don't want you to bite me, I whisper. Not ever. He frowns and turns from me, running his hands through his thick hair, before walking to his desk and ringing a small bell. Let us meet your chef. The butler knocks twice on the door, and then enters, announcing the man behind him as he does so, and I gasp, my eyes widening as I turn to stare back at Nicholas. He looks in control, as he always does, but there's a slight uncertainty in the quirk of his lips, as though he doesn't know if he's done the right thing. Monsieur Contel, I whisper. Bonjour, Josephine. He smiles his heavy French accent taking me straight back to the restaurant in France. I'd spent so many nights after work and days before, leaning against his stainless steel benches and gleaning every bit of information I could about becoming a Michelin-starred Cordon Bleu chef. And now here he was, in Ariston. I couldn't believe it. How? I ask, spinning to look at both Nicholas and him, as they shake hands. Your fiancé, Mr. Lumiere? invited me to stay and teach you. I had a three-month-long service leave owed, so I thought, why not? Fiancé? I hear my voice go up three octaves as Nicholas gives an imperceptible shake of his head and takes my hand, squeezing it hard as he turns to smile at Monsieur Contel. And I couldn't ask for a finer chef. This isn't the place for you, chef. I shake my head trying to impress upon him the fear in my eyes as I pull my hand, painfully, from Nicholas's strong grip and step towards Monsieur Contel. Please, go back to Paris. I don't need a chef of your standing and experience to teach me the basics. I'm afraid I'll just be wasting your time. My captor moves to stand beside me, placing his arm around my waist, as I stiffen in his embrace. Not at all, Josephine, darling. 
Monsieur Contel is excited to serve here. Isn't that so? He turns his charm full blast on the chef who gives me a concerned glance, but nods. Very well. My butler will show you to the kitchens. Nicholas smiles, his arm still clamping me in place beside him. Josephine will join you in a few moments, and your lessons can begin. Chef Contel nods and gives me an uncertain smile, before turning and following the butler out of the room. The butler gives me a withering look as he leaves. I don't know if he told Nicholas I'd drugged his tea, but I no longer have a stash of unused sedatives in my room, so I'm thinking, yes. As they go, I round on Nicholas, turning to face him, his arms still fixed around my waist. You can't have him here, you psycho. Set him free. Nicholas laughs, but gazes down at me, an amused set to his lips. He's no prisoner. I've paid him five times his normal salary and given him a house and car to boot. Believe me, he is very, very happy to be here. Unlike some. I frown as I notice his eyes slip from mine, to my lips. You told him I was your fiancé, I accuse. He shrugs. Girlfriend doesn't really cover our relationship. Our commitment will be lifelong. Yeah, right. As long as my life lasts, not yours. I mutter, struggling to pull myself out of his arms as he tightens his hold. Why do you resist me so, Josephine? You know you want me as much as I want you. Would it make you happy to become my wife? To wear that title? Rather than be my kept? Is that what you require to acknowledge my sincerity? You are seriously on drugs, mister, I mutter, still struggling. And don't even think of using any of your crazy mind powers on me again. I swear, I'll never speak to you again if you repeat anything like that stunt you pulled the other night. Josephine. He begins to chuckle again. I assure you I have no more crazy mind powers up my sleeve. And what I did to you... He leans forward running his nose from my collarbone up to my ear, slowly. Was something that can only be done to my kept. I close my eyes for a second. His nose is giving me goosebumps and sending delicious shivers up and down my spine. It's difficult to concentrate. I am not your kept, I mutter, trying to lean away from his nose as he continues to run it up and down my neck. No. He laughs quietly. If you hadn't wanted it, wanted me, it wouldn't have worked on you, Josephine. And tell me, have any of your other lovers ever made you come, with a word, or otherwise? That is none of your goddamn business, I mutter through clenched teeth. Now let me go. I will. He looks me in the eyes. After a kiss. I'm not going to kiss you. We could stand here for a very long time. He smirks. I am certainly quite comfortable and happy to do so. Chef Contel might begin to worry, though. And if he worries too much, it might impact on our arrangement in unforeseen ways. I frown and stare back at him, recognizing his threat, powerless to do anything about it, as he raises one eyebrow, challenging me. Get it over with, then, I mutter. He slowly releases his grip around my waist so it's less a constraint and more an embrace. I stand stiffly, not pulling away. Half of me wants to raise a knee to his balls. The other half just wants to get the hell out of this room without any more drama. And a small part, a very small part, wants him to kiss me. Slowly, he lowers his mouth to mine and gently places a soft, almost chaste kiss on my lips before releasing me and stepping back. Was that so bad? His eyes are dark, hooded as he murmurs his question. But I don't answer. I can't. That kiss had sent shivers down my spine. It was light, warm, intoxicating, and I wanted none of those feelings. At the same time, I wanted more. My nipples have hardened, my stomach tightened into a knot, and I know he's fully aware of the effect he's had on me. I frown and turn to the door. He doesn't stop me, but I hear his chuckle as I close it firmly behind me and lean against it to catch my breath. Holy hell, 
I whisper. Chapter 8 No, Josephine, Chef repeats. It's not a mystery as to why this dish is unsatisfactory. He points to my failed attempt at Faison en Cocotte Vigneron. There are three reasons a dish fails. Technical error, execution error, and flavor error. Now tell me, which do you think you've made? I frown down at the dish. It's basically pheasants baked with red and green grapes. I think maybe I didn't cook the birds long enough. Chef, I think it was an execution error. I skewered them as you showed me, to ensure the juices ran pink, rather than red. But, since they're so tough, there was obviously too much red, too much blood. I should have cooked them longer. Mmm, he nods. And how do you propose to rescue this meal? Um, cook them more? Yes, he laughs gently. It's not rocket science, Josephine. Put them back in the oven, and when their juice runs clear, and they are tender when stabbed, they're done. But don't be too hard on yourself. Books don't teach execution. I smile in relief. Thank you, chef. Allow them, perhaps ten more minutes. He smiles, taking off his hat and apron. And then if you feel your grape sauce is not quite thick enough, add more arrowroot. It should just coat the back of the spoon. Yes, chef. I'm disappointed my sauce wasn't up to par either, but I hide this and get busy as he leaves, turning back to place my failed pheasants into the oven once more. I'm so busy cleaning up and preparing dessert that I don't notice I'm not alone until I turn back to the long pine workbench to see Nicholas sitting on a stool, chin resting in his hands, watching me. Startled, I allow the side of the hot tray I'm holding to touch the inside of my arm, burning a long straight line into the skin. Ouch! Far out! I frown, dropping the tray onto the bench and turning to the sink immediately to run cold water over the burn, noting ruefully that it'll fit nicely with all the other burn marks I have on both forearms, some fresh, some just faded white scars. He appears beside me and gripping my arm before I can stop him, raises it so he can see what I've done. Show me. It's just a burn, Nicholas, I mutter, pulling my arm from his grip and running it once more under the tap. You are used to this pain? Pain? No, I snort. I'm used to burning myself, though. It's an occupational hazard. And don't go telling me anything creepy, like your blood can heal me or something. I'm not falling for it. My blood can't heal, Josephine, unless you are kept. Then it heals. Whoa, what? I turn to look into his earnest eyes. Are you for real? He shrugs and returns to his stool. The kept heal from all wounds, I told you this. No, you said they couldn't be killed by anyone except for you. Josephine, think about it. I feed daily upon my kept. If they didn't heal, they'd have bite marks all over them. They heal instantaneously. All over them? My voice, I know has risen. I thought you freaks just fanged people's necks? His laughter's soft, and I know he's shaking his head at my stupidity again. Josephine, there are arteries all over your body. Your neck, yes, your wrists, your inner thigh. I stare down at my arm. The smarting is beginning to ease, and consider his last words, trying hard to ignore the tiny thrill they sent through my body at his seductive tone. You can cut the crap, Nicholas. I know what you're trying to do when you talk like that. Like what? Your voice low, sultry. I know you're employing some vampire magic shit again. I've warned you about that. He bursts out laughing, the sound echoing around the kitchen. Josephine, I told you I don't have any more tricks up my sleeve. If you're getting turned on by my voice, that's all on you. I'm not turned on, I snort flipping off the tap angrily and turning to face him, my face flaming. Are you not? He murmurs the question, his words sending shivers down my spine. Stop it. Stop what? Stop doing that thing with your voice. He laughs again, harder this time. I'm really not doing anything. I take a deep breath and turn back to the oven, away from his gaze, away from the sight of him leaning on my bench 
his white dress shirt slightly open at the neck, black tie carelessly hanging, undone, to the side. What do you even want? I mutter, my back to him. Dinner will be at least an hour away. This is my safe place. He doesn't answer, and I turn back to him. His expression shows hurt, if that's even possible. I thought to watch you work, that is all. Well, I don't work well with a blood-sucking monster leering over my shoulder. I snap. I see his eyes darken, jaw harden, and I know I've angered him, and he rises to leave. I see. I will not invade your privacy again. As he turns to leave, I feel bad, which I remind myself, is stupid, because he is my kidnapper. But still, something causes me to open my mouth, to apologize. If you really want to be in here, you should have come earlier, when you could have been of use. He pauses mid-step. I'll keep that in mind. But you should know, Josephine. I find your voice a turn-on, too. I gasp as he leaves, shutting the door quietly behind him. Chapter 9 The hairdresser arrives shortly after nine with a huge array of bottles and equipment, talking the whole time she sets up, under the careful scrutiny of the butler. I smile, listening to her carefree banter about the village and how excited she is to be invited here for the first time, having lived basically on the estate since her birth, but never having set foot inside the manor before. She rattles on about how beautiful the house and my room are, how wonderful it must be to live in such luxury, etc., and I wait for her to slow down so I can consider how to use her in my next escape plan. Her arrival was a complete surprise. Nicholas didn't tell me last night that he'd organized her visit. Then again, he'd said very little at the meal last night, which was unusual. Butler, I address my prison warder, refusing to call him by his first name because I dislike him as much as he dislikes me. Can you let Chef Contel know I'll be a little late today, and I haven't planned yet for the evening meal, so I'm not sure I have anything to prep. The chef will not be required tonight, or the next three nights the butler intones, not meeting my eyes. I have given him some time off. Oh, I guess I'll just cook for Nicholas and I then. You will not be required to leave your room for the duration of the week, he says, his voice barely containing his joy at imparting this news. What? Why? I want to see Nicholas the moment he wakes. This is bullshit. The master is away from home until Friday. He smiles benignly at me. I open my mouth to give him a piece of my mind, but shut it quickly as the hairdresser bids me sit in front of the big dressing table mirror. Black, I mutter angrily to her. Turn it black. A nice choice, she nods and smiles, her friendly eyes meeting mine in the mirror. With your coloring, I think a violet black, maybe some auburn highlights, nothing too dark. Lady, you have no idea my furious brain thinks. Yeah, whatever, I murmur. You're the expert. She smiles and begins, and I look up at the mirror and meet the butler's bored expression. You don't have to stay, moron. Just lock the door on your way out. That's your intention anyway, isn't it? His lordship expressed concern that I ensure you do not leave the manor, he intones. Well, considering there's a trigger-happy gamekeeper roaming around, the fact that the only clothes I still own are ball gowns, and that I'm being watched constantly by an overgrown penguin, I point to him. I can't see any issue. Can you? He frowns, and I watch as he leaves. Above the snick, snick of the scissors, I still hear the key turn in the lock, but my heart lightens knowing he's left us, because I fully intend to get the hairdresser to help me escape. So, I look up at her my chest tight with hope that she's not also under the impression I'm brain damaged, and that if she is, I can stifle that with a long and intelligent conversation. How long have you lived in the village? She laughs and starts to tell me her life history. Later, many hours later, I stare at myself in the mirror and shake my head. It looks wonderful. The cut has managed to highlight my cheekbones, and the layers of gentle curls fall in graceful swirls, 
rather than their usual unruly chaos. You've done such a brilliant job, I smile, genuinely impressed. Thanks, hun, she laughs, packing up her gear. I brace myself and cross my fingers what I'm about to ask will be okay. Look, before you go, I wonder if you'd mind taking a letter with you to the village, to post for me, if that's not too much trouble. Happy to, she says brightly. I rise and walk quickly to the desk near the door and scribble yet another help message to James. It's been two weeks since my failed escape attempt, and I've had no answer to my last letter. I can only assume that either the gamekeeper didn't post it, or James is not contactable through the school anymore. But I have to try once more. I have no one else to turn to. Addressing the envelope quickly, I hand the letter over to the hairdresser with a shy smile. As she takes it, her eyes alight on the name on the envelope, and she smiles. Well, this will take no time at all to reach its mark, she says, smiling. Pardon? James, she laughs. I can just hand this to him tonight. Wait, I hold my breath, my eyes wide. You know James? Sure, he's staying right in the village at the inn. He's writing a book, you know, on Ariston Village and the area. He's a real favorite with all the single ladies. She rolls her eyes and giggles. In fact, I'm pretty sure the inn's never had so much business since he started staying there. I stare at her. I know my face has gone white. Wait, I'm sorry, she says hurriedly, seeing my expression. If he's someone special to you, I didn't mean to offend. Not at all, I squeak, my heartbeat racing. He's a former colleague. I had no idea he was staying locally. Do you mind if I change my letter? She returns it to me, and I scurry back to the desk as she turns to complete her packing. I know I have only minutes until the butler returns. He has some kind of sixth sense about these things. That, or I'm paranoid. But either way, I know I need to hurry. I scribble quickly. James, I'm a prisoner of Lord Nicholas Montague, a.k.a. Dracula, in his manner. Save me. Josephine. I hastily hand the new note to the hairdresser, and she pops it into her apron pocket, just as I hear the key turn in the lock. I know, my brain racing, that I have to find a way to get a reply, and the words spiral out of my mouth before I've even thought them through. Can you come back, say, every three days? I ask her, as the butler steps into the room. I'd like to have my hair regularly styled. It looks so much better than when I do it. Absolutely, she beams. I'd love to. Terrific. See you then, she says turning for the door as the butler stands aside and waves her through. I can see he's going to follow her and lock me in again. Wait, I scowl at him. Just what am I meant to do, locked up in my room for the next few days? I don't even have a bloody television. Without answering, he turns for the door, tapping his hand on something he's left on the desk, something I didn't even notice him putting there when he entered. Something very familiar. On top of it is an envelope in heavy cream paper, addressed to me in handwriting that's also as familiar to me as my own. My Josephine, I know you're finding it hard to believe that I find you incredibly attractive, and that it's more than just your blood that draws me to you. I also know you still don't believe I didn't kill your Italian chef. The fact you've mostly served me Italian cuisine for the past many weeks, don't think I haven't noticed, is testament to that. I have to go away for a few days. While I'm gone, I've left you proof of my feelings and of the veracity of my claims regarding Sicily. I hope you'll take the time to read this. You know I tell only the truth in my journals. I shall claim it back upon my return. Yours, if you will but say the words. Nicholas. I place the letter down, slowly, and pick up the journal. It's his latest the very one I returned to him all those months ago when Daniel and I were caught red-handed in his library. The journal that started this whole damn business when I found it in the park that night. Flicking through it, I see he continued writing in it once it was returned, and some earlier entries have been pasted in, obviously written on sheets of paper, with the intent of including them when his journal was found. 
my heart in my mouth, which is suddenly drier than the Sahara, I turn wordlessly and climb the steps to my bed, the journal held tight against my chest. I want to know the truth, but I also know there may be things in here that frighten the living shit out of me, but I can't not read it. With trembling fingers, I turn past the entry where he told me, in writing, he was going to kill me. The entry that had seen me bolt from the U.S. to England. My heart in my mouth, I begin reading. New entry, she has run. I do like a chase, usually, but she took my journals, which is unfortunate, and so I'm not happy about the pursuit. If I thought she had only the one, I might let her run a little longer, live a little longer before I catch her, but her ridiculous police officer confessed she has two. I admit, I enjoyed our little chat, and I'm sure had he not been coming apart at the seams, literally, he could have taken a lesson or two in interrogation from one so practised, but sadly for him, that was not to be. What he told me, enraged me, and not being into the new age stress balls I've seen advertised, which you apparently can squeeze and supposedly your anger dissipates. I dealt with my anger and frustration the only way I know how, by using him as a squeeze ball. But now I am left wondering, how does she have my first journal as well as my last? Could she all along have been aligned with the hunters? Have I once again missed something obvious? Gerald will have a field day if that is the case. Either way, I must find her. I pause in my reading, my hands visibly shaking with anger. He used my boyfriend as a squeeze ball? Oh, Jesus. Images flash up before my eyes of exactly how he did it, of what it might look like, fuck, feel like. I recall James's comment that Blake was in bits and pieces all over the room, and I shudder. Do I even want to read on from here? I'm living with this psycho. Do I really want to have in my head all the horrible ways he's going to kill me one day? Yes. I have to know more. I have to read on, because sooner or later, surely, he'll slip up and reveal something I can use. New Entry I must delay my hunt for the cook for a day or two while I return to Eriston briefly, to deal with Butler Edward. Apparently during a recent gathering of the hunt, some of the guests were found to be trespassing in my library. Why the fuck was it unlocked? Will be my first question to the old man, followed by, why should I let you live? But then again, he has been in the family for fifty odd years, and his father before him and his before that, so perhaps I had better rein in my temper. Still, I'll make him very aware that this is the only reason I'm not ripping his head off. Even now, thinking about strangers glimpsing my journals, what the hell was the idiot thinking? If they've read any of my entries, I have several more people I'll need to dispose of, and taking a killing detour is not in my plans right now. I have to pursue the cook. I'll know more when I land. I've arranged to meet my new landscape designer at the same time. May as well kill two birds with one stone, metaphorically speaking, of course. I can't actually afford to kill another landscape designer if I wish to have my new garden finished this century. I giggle, but then remember I shouldn't find this man monster funny. Although, I've always enjoyed the way he writes, and the thought of him reaming that bastard butler does bring a smile to my face. I hope, though, that the butler didn't suggest Daniel had read any of the journals. My face blanches, and I hurriedly read on. New entry. Butler Edward lives for the moment, but he owes his life to the cook. I have my network of agents working around the clock, and I'm informed they're confident she's within reach. But something puzzles me. Something I hadn't expected has occurred, and it has left me both confused and at the same time full of expectation. She was here, she was disguised as waitstaff, and she was the one who trespassed in my study. Her accomplice was not involved in what she was doing. According to Edward, the boy had simply followed her because he was planning on making a pass. This sounds about right. Fucking little lords can't keep their hands off the staff. Never have. Never will. I don't know why I feel so angry at the idea of someone touching her, pressuring her, but it bothers me. According to Edward, the little bastard never got his way and was thoroughly contrite about being in an off-limits area. As for the cook, she left my journals and ran. 
Surely if she was aligned with the hunters, she would have kept the journals and used them for whatever ulterior purpose they had in mind. But she didn't. She returned them. She even had the courtesy to put them back in their correct order. I wonder what she thought of this place, what she felt when she entered this library. Was she frightened? It was a brave move, a bold move, to come here, knowing me as she does. My estimation of her rises day by day, as does my expectation that when we meet, killing her will be both trial and tribulation. I pause my reading as I hear a knock on the door and watch as a maid comes in and delivers a tray of lunch before bobbing a small curtsy and locking the door behind her. Rising, I wander over and lift the silver dome lid off the plate. Toad in the hole, you bastard butler. Snorting, I slam the lid back down and return to bed to continue my reading. New entry. Gerald phoned tonight. It's been some time since we've been in contact. He's been abroad and his yacht has no phone reception. Or that's what he tells me. Personally, I think he simply does not like to be disturbed when he's training a new kept. He was not at all happy to learn that my journals had been returned, or that I hadn't found and murdered the hunter who received the posted copy from Lucy Burnshire. Gerald, calm down, I told him after he finished ranting. I'm going to kill the girl who read my journals. Then I'll return to the States and track down the hunter. Obviously the cook knows who that is, or she wouldn't have had both journals in her possession. One will lead me to the other. I don't understand, he growled. How is it that you left her alive for all those weeks, reading your journal, and never told me about it? I frowned when he asked this, because I had no rational answer. I doubt he would accept that I liked watching the play of emotions across her face as she read, that I found her intriguing. It amused me to watch her read, I confessed lightly, and I thought, perhaps, there might be a link to the hunters. After all, she worked in an educational institution, and we know Miss Burnshire posted her package to one. A long straw even for you, Montague, he snorted. I knew he was angrier than he was letting on to call me by my surname. Never mind, Gerald. I have security searching for the cook. She won't be far. When I've dealt with her, I'll mop up the hunters. You'd better ensure that is indeed what happens, he muttered, before doing something very un -Gerald like and hanging up on me. I called my security immediately our conversation ended so abruptly. It turns out I haven't underestimated the cook's intelligence. She's outsmarted my investigators, and they've admitted she's disappeared without a trace. Apparently, once she left Eriston, she became a ghost. She has not touched her bank account since fleeing Boston, limited as they are. She hasn't purchased a plane, train, ferry or bus ticket. Where can she have gone? My instincts tell me she's left England. She would want to get as far away from me as possible. But how, without transport? I wonder if she hitchhiked to the continent. I'll start my search in Wren, her ancestral home. I don't think she would have gone there. She's smart enough to know that I would have the resources to research her background. Still, it's a starting point. I'll travel to France and dine at my favourite Parisian restaurant tomorrow night. From there, I'll journey to Wren. New entry. Gerald has shared some disturbing news about his kept, which is causing me some consternation. He's keeping Margarita, my little cook's roommate. To say I'm shocked by the revelation is an understatement. How the fuck did that happen? I growled at him over the speakerphone as I dressed for dinner. A remarkable coincidence, he laughed. Like hell, Gerald. Coincidences like this don't just happen. How do you know she's not a hunter? How do you know she's not the one who received the first journal in the mail? His silence was deafening. Because unlike some, he snarled, I am not an idiot. Careful, Gerald. Oh, very well, he huffed. I heard the petulance in his tone and tightened my hold on my anger. Margarita is a little firecracker, he said, an amusing companion, but she's not well read, if you get my drift. I doubt very much that she's studied anything more than a fashion magazine her entire life. She certainly has no links to aristocracy, or indeed to anyone outside her family and a close circle of friends. My background checks were thorough. I remained silent, 
thinking through his explanation. I thought you might like to know that your prey is in Indonesia, he added slyly. What? The cook, Josephine, is hiding in Bali. Apparently, it was as far away as she could think to get, and as far as her limited resources would allow her to travel. And you know this how? Margarita spoke to her. And you believe the cook would have told your kept where she was hiding? They trust each other completely, Gerald drawled. Apparently they're best friends. I could imagine him smirking as he said this, but once again the fact that we're both entangled with girls who know one another sends the hair at the back of my neck crawling. Something doesn't ring true. Nevertheless, this lead is more than what my security force could find. Gerald, I sighed, your little kept is going to be very annoyed with you when she finds out you helped have her best friend murdered. I'll deal with my kept, you deal with the cook. Bali it is, I groaned. I hung up and phoned my pilot, directing him to prepare immediately for a departure to Indonesia, then phoned the restaurant and cancelled my reservation. And here I sit now, on board my jet, filling in this foolish journal, waiting to land in tropical Bali. I pause reading and frown. Yes, it is strange that Gerald should be in contact with Margarita on Tinder, choose her as his kept, and that I should find that journal. Coincidence? If so, Nicholas is right. It's a very odd one. New entry. I met her tonight. Coincidence is starting to sound like my middle name, and I almost laughed out loud as I entered my favorite Parisian restaurant, after several fruitless weeks of searching Bali, only to find her assigned to my table. She smells divine. I could have killed her then and there, of course, lured her outside on some pretext, or waited until she left work and pounced upon her. But there's something about her, her expressions, her shy smile, her intelligent eyes, something that stalls my vicious tendencies. But she must die. She knows too much. She knows of vampires, of Ariston, of me. I've booked again for tomorrow night. I shall allow her to serve me one more time. New entry. She's so sure of herself for one so young. Tomorrow night. I will do it tomorrow night. New entry. She has a wry and irreverent sense of humour which I find attractive and refreshing. I almost choked on my wine tonight over something she said. Tomorrow night I will end her. Tomorrow night and I am absolute in this. New entry. Her background is miserable. Losing her parents at such a young age has made her strong and resilient, and yet there was something so endearing about her quiet acknowledgement of her past difficulties. One more night won't make a difference here or there. New entry. I am so aware of her body, her slight movements, her breathing, her heartbeat, her smell. The fact that she stands behind me, that I cannot see her bright eyes, her smirk. All this heightens my senses, making me hyper-aware of every little nuance in her voice. She speaks with intelligence, she's well-read, something I hadn't anticipated, and she takes such joy in a minutiae of tiny things that I have all but forgotten. I look forward to each night, as I have not for so many centuries. New entry. Gerald phoned tonight and asked why I was still in Europe, and not in the US dispensing with the hunter, and I had to confess, I have yet to kill Josephine. To say he was angry was an understatement, and in truth, I'm angry with myself. I haven't written properly in my journal for several weeks. My nights have been spent doing only one thing, admiring Josephine, and looking back now on my entries, I see I'm beginning to sound like an obsessed fool. I don't want to share that knowledge with anyone. Gerald, calm down. I'm going to do it. I'm simply enjoying the chase, you must admit. You know how that is. Even as I said this, I wondered, am I? Is it the chase I'm enjoying? Or is it her company? Under different circumstances, yes, he agreed. But the longer we leave the hunters unattended to, the greater their strength. Who knows what they're doing with the information from your journals, Nicholas? Yes, you're right, Gerald, although I do have some information that will cheer you up. The hunter's name is James Lanesborough, he's been living under the name James Hunter, and he was staying not five miles from where your kept has her apartment. I hope you're going to tell me he's no longer breathing, he said quietly. 
Actually, no. He is still breathing. He and his sister have disappeared. But I do have a photograph of him. Nicholas, Gerald growled. Gerald, I snarled back. Don't start with me. You had responsibility for the US hunters, and one was right under your nose while you were playing catcher kept and attending the races. I at least tortured the one on my end. Tortured, yes, he snorted. But you let her go. And you let yours go. I couldn't find him, he shouted down the line. Maybe if you hadn't been looking at a little piece of Mexican ass, you would have kept both eyes on your job, I said quietly. I knew my voice contained a deadly edge to it, but I was well and truly sick of being reminded of how remiss I'd been with Miss Lucy Burnshaw. Perhaps you're right, he said, changing tack. So take a leaf out of my book, Nicholas. Keep your eye on your position, your existence and your responsibilities, and don't get distracted by a piece of low-life skirt. I felt my hackles bristle at his summation of Josephine. Gerald, you've known me long enough to know class distinctions matter little to me in anything but my meals. If you don't plan to eat her, just kill her. Stop fucking around, Nicholas. Yes, Gerald, I sighed. You're right. Although even as I said this, I was torn. New entry. I asked her to dine with me tonight and then I let her go. For weeks we've spoken. But tonight, meeting her eyes, I confess she took my breath away. And when she realised who I was and ran, I was left bereft. I cannot kill her. I'll let Gerald know that she's no longer of any concern, and I'll assure him I'm switching my attention to the Lanesboroughs. I am not looking forward to this conversation. I put the journal down and yawn. There are only three or four more pages to go. But I'm so tired. And relieved. I'm relieved he was telling the truth when he said he planned to let me go, and stunned that he finds me. I mean, he really does find me. Attractive. But I know what I'm putting off. I need to read what happened to Lucy and Ricardo, to settle that matter once and for all. New entry. I've tracked Miss Burnshire to Sicily, and tonight I'll pop her little blonde head off her neck so fast she won't know what hit her. I feasted this week upon two blondes in the lead-up to this assassination, and I concede I was rougher than I had to be with them. My anger is such of late that I hardly know myself. I can only put it down to the fact that I am completely and utterly bored with pursuing these hunters, bored with my meals, bored with life itself, as I have not been for some time. Usually this despondency relates to being at Ariston, but not this time. I haven't returned to my ancestral seat in months. No, it's something else. I've been so maudlin I've kept to myself mostly, holed up in this apartment or that. I haven't even answered Gerald's calls. Lately he annoys me no end. He doesn't know I'm in Sicily. I'll inform him once the deed is done. New entry. I'm back at Eriston. Last night was horrendous and wonderful on many levels. I have much to think about. When I arrived in the village I knew Miss Burnshire to be staying in. It was very easy to find her. I simply followed her scent. But when I entered the apartment, I smelled someone else, someone familiar, someone I scarcely acknowledged even to myself I'd missed very much over the past weeks. Josephine. And I smelled something else. Blood. My heart in my mouth I took the steps leading to the upper story of the silent apartment two at a time. And for the first time in nearly five hundred years, I thought my world might come to an end. Because the body on the floor, at first, I thought was my Josephine. Two heartbeats later I looked to the windowsill and realised it was just the hunter. But in those seconds a realisation hit me, a feeling that I'd thought never to have known again. I care for Josephine. The thought that she might have been dead had caused such instantaneous pain, such terror in my soul, that I know now there's only one reparation. I must have her. Spinning from the room I followed her scent down the hallway, but found only an empty bedroom. I paused, I confess, to smell her pillow and open her drawers, to touch her belongings and revel in being so close to her, so intimate. Hearing a noise, a faint scream, I turned and walked back towards the kitchen, only to see the object of my obsession meet my eyes and fall backwards down the stairs. I rushed to catch her, but even my great speed was no match for socks on timber treads, and I caught her just as her head hit the floor. 
I knew as soon as I lifted her into my arms that I would never let her go. New entry. She will not consent to be my kept. Her injuries heal well, and I thrill in the knowledge she's in my home sleeping not four doors down from me. Her very presence nearby makes me happy, but her distrust and fear of me is evident in every look and word. I've tried to reassure her that I didn't kill her chef, that I'm working hard to find out who did, but in the absence of evidence to the contrary, who could blame her for not believing me? She wants me to set her free. I would if that would make her happy, but I cannot because I believe whoever killed Ms. Burnshire may have actually been trying to kill my Josephine. As soon as I saw her hair colour, I felt strongly this was the case. Unless you knew either of them, they could easily be mistaken for each other. And yet, who wants Josephine dead, other than myself and Gerald? I cannot let her go until I know who sought to kill her in Sicily, and also, if I'm honest, it would not make me happy to release her. I concede I'm a selfish creature holding her my captive, but if she will just get to know me, accept all I offer. I desire her. I like her. I want to give her the world. And yet, I want to give her more, too. I want to offer her the protection that only my blood can provide. I want her to agree to be mine. I want to know every feeling she has behind those deep, thoughtful eyes. I want to keep her. New entry. Weeks now she's been here. She's healed well. And I've tried every way possible to convince her to be mine. I've installed her in the best room, bought her everything she could desire, hired a chef to train her in the kitchen, and confessed my attraction to her. Nightly we sit across from each other, and I eat her amazing food. And every night her scent draws me to her in such a way that, were I not a gentleman, I would throw her onto the table and ravish her. But that is not my way. She must come willingly. I know she desires me too. I feel it. I sense it. Not just because of what I am, but I feel a connection with her on an intellectual level. She's amusing, witty and challenging. Something I enjoy more than I imagined I would. And yet, she does not want my bite. Tonight, seeing her dressed in that tight black gown, I was almost undone. I need to get to London and feed, and I want to meet with my security team to discuss their findings regarding Sicily. And there's something else I need to try. Perhaps some distance will do us both some good. But I shall miss her. I close the journal and put it down. I don't want to read any more about how much he likes me and wants me. It makes me uncomfortable for many reasons. And if I'm honest, his war with himself is not dissimilar to the feelings I have when I'm around him. I put my hand momentarily to my mouth as I remember his soft kiss and take it hastily away, reminding myself that I'm locked in a bedroom because of this man. Dropping his journal to the floor, I curl up, hungry, and go to sleep. Chapter 10 I stare back at him and chew slowly, thinking through what I'm going to say, how I'm going to broach the subject of what I want. The hairdresser returned this week, bringing with her a very welcome note from James. He's here to save me. He'll be waiting for me in Constance's empty manor at noon this Friday. I need to find a way to get there, and I'm now determined, given that Nicholas has confessed in his journals that he's attracted to me, that if I must use my feminine wiles, I will. Nicholas, I put down my fork. He looks up in surprise and, I think, delight. I rarely start conversations with him. Yes. I want to be able to go outside. I want to walk around the estate. No. I can't go anywhere. I frown, screwing up my nose. You have the gamekeeper on red alert. It's not wise. Why not? Josephine, please. He chuckles. We both know you'll try to run away again. I turn my head to the side and smirk at him. I thought you liked the chase. He smiles back, a genuine wide smile, and I glimpse his fangs in the candlelight. I know my pulse is racing. He is a scary, scary bastard. You know me well, and yet, I think we're beyond that now. I missed you while I was away. Did you miss me? I frown. I did miss him, but I don't want him to know that. I missed food, real food 
that was for sure. Thinking of the stodge I'd been forced to eat by the butler suddenly makes me see red. No, I didn't miss you. I missed food, and I missed my freedom even more than I usually do. If you think you're going to endear me to you by starving me to death, think again. This is not a reenactment of the taming of the shrew, you psycho. I wonder as I say this, if he wrote that. I see the little muscle in his cheek tense, as though he's biting his tongue, and something in me hopes he'll retort, get angry, just do something, anything, to upset this cycle of eat, chat, sleep, cook, eat, chat. I can't take any more of it. Rising, he wipes his mouth with his napkin and makes his way towards me, slowly, with purpose, his eyes never leaving mine. I pick up my fork, just in case I need a weapon and have to plunge it into him. I wonder, idly, watching him stalk closer, if that's why we're eating from gold rather than silver cutlery, and decide, probably. Reaching me, he leans down and releases my grip on my cutlery, pulling me in one swift motion up from my chair and into his arms. Before I can say anything, his lips cover mine, and as I tense and put my hands to his chest to push him away, his kiss softens, roaming, rather than ravishing. Although my brain is screaming at me not to succumb, my body responds, because this man wants me, really wants me, and this is becoming more and more evident as the kiss deepens and his tongue explores my mouth. Suddenly, the fact that he's 500 years old and a monster is of no concern. Every nerve in my body is thrilled, exhilarated as I taste him. I feel his mounting arousal and press myself tighter to him, winding my hands in his hair. Maybe this is what I wanted all along, a release of all this tension, this anger and frustration, this attraction. Groaning, he pulls away and holds me at arm's length as I stare at him, panting. Will you say the moon is the sun and the sun is the moon, Josephine? I narrow my eyes at him and push him away, disgusted once more at my traitorous body's reactions to him. He makes no move to stop me as I head for the door, but calls my name, and I pause momentarily. Yes. I snap, my fingers on the handle. He hesitates for a moment before murmuring. Your hair looks lovely. I say nothing, just walk out and down the long hall to my room. My knees don't stop shaking until I reach my door, and I know my pulse is still racing, my face flushed. That was possibly the best kiss I've ever had in my life, and I'm pretty sure if he'd decided to throw me on the table and take me, I wouldn't have quibbled. I feel thankful, but also embarrassed, that he was the stronger of us and stopped when he did. Shaking my head at my weakness, I open the door and see a gift-wrapped box sitting on my bed. Let me guess, the head of my enemy, I mutter, shuddering when I think it actually could be something like that, knowing Nicholas. Taking a deep breath, I sit down and open up the box. Inside there are two packages one awkwardly shaped, one obviously a book. I open the book first. It's a thick, heavy tome, beautifully bound in dark blue leather. Inside, all the pages are blank, except one which bears an inscription. My Josephine, I thought it time you had your own recipe book. Yours, Nicholas. I shake my head and run my hands over the leather. Once again, so thoughtful. Sighing, Confused even more over my attraction to this mercurial man, I turn to open the second package and gasp when I see what's inside. It's the blue antique casserole set I'd admired while working as a waitress in Paris. How could he know? I shake my head and, carrying it carefully, place it on my desk near the door. I'll most likely use it first thing tomorrow in my next lesson with Monsieur Contel. Turning back to the bed, I pick up my new recipe book, and curling up still in my gown from dinner, I make my first entry. No sooner have I finished writing the recipe and its accompanying notes, when I hear a tap on the door. Frowning, I close the book. I know that knock. And I know I'm going to let him in. 
Closing my eyes for a second, I tell myself firmly to get a grip and not get too close to him. Definitely no kisses, no kisses, no kisses, I repeat as a silent mantra. Come in. As Nicholas walks to the bed, his face serious, I quickly sit up, my feet on the steps, frowning as I meet his eyes. He's still wearing his tuxedo from dinner, but his tie's undone and hanging loosely to one side, and the top button of his shirt's undone. It's a look I find particularly appealing. He's so hot. I have to repeat my mantra to myself once more. His eyes drift to the book on the bed. I've thought about what you requested. Do you like my gifts? I frown and try to focus on what he's saying. But here, in my bedroom, the memory of that kiss still fresh upon my lips, I can't help but admire his physique. My eyes drift to his lips as he talks, my own remembering their feel and causing a tingle and tightening deep down in my stomach. I want this man, vampire or not, and knowing he wants me just as much, perhaps more, just makes it all the harder to resist. I clear my throat. Yes, thank you. How did you know I wanted this cooking set? He smiles a genuine smile that reaches his eyes. I didn't. I was looking for a gift for you and it caught my eye. Did you really want it? Yes, but... I frown, confused. I saw it in a little store in Paris. Yes, that's where I found it, not far from our restaurant. I raise my eyebrows in surprise. A little part of me is thrilled by his reference to where I worked as our restaurant. I thought you went to London, to prey upon wealthy women. He laughs and sits down beside me, and I don't flinch as he reaches over to capture one of my curls and run it through his long fingers. Did I tell you how much I like your hair? Yes, I breathe, every nerve on end at his proximity, his scent, my brain scrambling for control over my body. But why were you in Paris? Business. He drops my curl and runs his finger from my shoulder, down the outside of my arm to my hand. I hold my breath as my skin turns to goosebumps, and a delicious shiver runs down my spine. Noting my reaction, he looks up into my eyes and down to my lips, now slightly parted. I can see he's going to kiss me. I want him to kiss me, but at the same time, I don't. Are you going to let me go outside? I whisper. He says nothing just leans forward and gathering me in his arms, brings his lips once more down to mine. Desire flames through me as I taste his mouth again, and all the sensations I had in the dining room come crashing back with ten times the force. I'm frustrated, angry, scared, lonely, horny, drawn, compelled, pent up. I close my eyes as he moves to press me down onto the bed, his broad chest covering mine, his kiss taking away all my self-control. I want him, and he wants me, but I want freedom more. Don't I? I pull my lips away from him, every nerve in my body screaming at me in anger at my refusal to give way to my need for him. Are you going to let me out? I ask again, panting, my hands either side of his face, holding his lips just a word away from my own. Josephine, please. Stop trying to run from me. Stop denying what we both want. I want to show you how wonderful we can be together. I'm offering you myself, can't you see that? No, I frown, moving my hand to his chest and pushing him away. He complies immediately, and I sit up, suddenly angry, my hair all over the place. You're not offering yourself to me. You're forcing me to sacrifice myself to you, to stay as your prisoner, as your own personal fucking suck doll. I've told you before, I'm never, never going to agree to that. He shakes his head sadly. I want you, Josephine. Is that so bad? You don't want me for me, I mutter. You want me for my blood. He growls, reaching for me and pushing me down once more, so I'm lying on my back once again, and he's on top of me. I want you. For you. I want all of you. Get off me. 
Shaking his head, he grips my hands and pulls them above my head as he leans down to capture my lips once more, his mouth forcefully covering mine, his tongue probing to gain entry. I try to roll him off, but he's strong, too strong. My hands are imprisoned, and my bucking and rolling only seem to inflame his intent. Recognizing that struggling won't work, I lie still, fists clenched, eyes squeezed shut, refusing to give him even the satisfaction of feeling me struggle. Sensing my passive resistance, he takes his lips from mine and trails them across my cheek, down my neck, and back up to my ear. You said you wouldn't force me, I hiss. You said you were a gentleman. He pauses his kissing and looks deep into my eyes, sighing and releasing my hands. Josephine, I've told you what I want. I offer myself to you now, all of me. Is there no part you want? I meet his gaze steadily. It's like his eyes are gazing into my very soul, and his own, this time, show no sign of his arrogance or control, only vulnerability. And this, this is more powerful and dangerous than any strength he could have shown. Although my brain tells me to hold to my resolve, his closeness, his openness, his raw sexuality and attraction wars with my rational and logical side. And leaning up, I kiss him gently, opening my mouth to him, tasting him as I did in the dining hall his exquisite scent filling my nostrils. Groaning, he kisses me back, first gently, testing. But as I accept his tongue and allow my own to meet his, the kiss deepens in intensity, and it's as though we're two different people, not the combatants we've been, but partners, lovers who finally allowed their passion to melt their resolves and who no longer wish to waste any more time. Reaching behind him, I pull off his shirt as he tears my dress open, buttons flying like popcorn, and slides his hands down my body, to my underwear. I gasp as he runs his hand over my panties, not removing them, but hooking them aside with one finger and rubbing me gently. Grinding against him, I push his pants down eagerly and grasp him, guiding him towards where I want him, his heat making me almost sob with need, a need so long denied. He presses closer, but not close enough, and I urge him on with my hips and my hands, wanting him on me, in me, now. He pulls my underwear further aside and rubs his long length up and down my entry, teasingly, tantalizing every inch of me. Do you want me, Josephine? Do you want this part of me at least? Yes, I whisper. Now, Nicholas. His eyes are intense as I feel him position himself against my outer lips. Say you will stay with me always. Say it. His mouth is leaving a trail of kisses up the side of my neck to my ear, his teeth gently nipping my lobes, his body hovering over mine, resisting my hands on his buttocks, pulling him, kneading him. I want you, Josephine. Say you want me. I want you. He eases forward slowly, just the tip of his body entering mine, as I groan and squirm in impatience. Nicholas, now. He groans as he pushes a little deeper. I need you, Josephine. I want to keep you. I open my eyes and look into his. So deep. So sincere. So full of desire. Nicholas, I whisper rocking my hips to pull him forward into me, forcefully. Take me now. Say I can keep you. I freeze, my brain registering what he's asking of me. No. His eyes harden as, growling, he pulls away, pushes my arms and legs from him, and sits up. Nicholas, what the fuck? I frown, my thoughts still scattered. Sighing, he turns and straightens my underwear, his hand lingering on my wetness, before rising, naked, his magnificent body still erect and displaying all that was so nearly mine. You and I will share something wonderful soon, when you agree to be mine, fully, forever. 
What? I whisper. But he's gone. The only evidence he was ever here. The scattered remains of my dress and buttons. His own clothes lying discarded on the floor near the bed. And my tattered self-respect. You will never, ever have me now, Lord Nicholas Montague. I vow into the empty room through lips still swollen from his kisses. Never. Chapter 11 Waking, I lie for a while, watching the dappled sunlight from the wall-length windows play across the pretty fabric of my bed, making the cherubs look as though they're dancing through the flowers. I smile, but then grimace as I remember the night before. How am I going to face him? Groaning, I rise, shower, and dress in the least fancy black gown I can find. A short-sleeved floor-length number with a sweetheart neckline, and prepare to head down to the kitchens for my lesson with Monsieur Contel. But as I exit my room, I see a note pinned to the outside of my door. My Josephine, I apologize for my inexcusable behavior last night. It will not happen again. Enjoy the sunshine. Yours, Nicholas. I frown and reread the note. Part of me's high-fiving myself over the fact that I've succeeded in gaining access to the grounds and can finally meet James. The other part of me, the dark and painfully growing part, is unhappy that I won't feel his body on mine again. If I'm honest, it was incredible. I wanted him, and I'm angry that we didn't finish what we started. Get a grip, girl, I whisper, and get the hell out of here before you let him suck you. I grimace at my double entendre and shake my head and turn back to my room to load my recipe books into my makeshift backpack and hack up another ball dress, long sleeve, because it's cold out. I take nothing else. If I'm leaving today, I want to ensure I travel light. Packed, I make my way down the many hallways and stairs and leave the manor, trying to look nonchalant and nodding to the gamekeeper as I make my way across the front lawn. I slow down, grimacing, as he and his stupid dog approach. Hello, Ms. Bailey, he smiles. Are you feeling better? You mean, am I still brain damaged? I sneer, seeing him wince at the venom in my tone and instantly feeling gratified. Well, have a nice day. He nods his head and turns to go. Wait, I call out. He spins back, his face wary. Have you been told to shoot me if I try to leave? I motion to the ever-present gun hanging from his shoulder, its long timber handle shiny from obvious use. His lordship would never ask anything like that, he says gently, frowning at me and, I'm sure, thinking I'm obviously still tapped. So, what are his orders if I run? Bring you home, he shrugs. I tip my head to the side and study him. Would you shoot me if he asked? He pauses, considering the question quite seriously. Well, that would depend, he says eventually. I nod. The staff here, and even the villagers to an extent, are obedient and obsequious to this ruling family. It was something to bear in mind, and something to remind James about when we escape. We have to be careful who we trust. Thank you for your honesty. I shake my head and snort. You have a great day, too. He nods again and turns away, and I continue my hike to Constance's house, which I think should take about forty minutes, if I take the quick way through the wooded path. The weather is brisk, but so is my walk, and I make it to her manor in no time at all. Pushing open the door to her former home, which strangely opens easily, as though it's regularly used despite the building's abandonment, I peer inside looking down a short, straight corridor, and call his name. James? Not hearing a response, I enter gingerly and walk down the hall, the floorboards creaking with every step, and peer left into what I can only assume was once a small parlor. The thought comes to me, as I look at the bare walls and the crumbling fireplace, that this was where Constance's body was laid out. And a wave of sadness sweeps over me for Nicholas and his loss, as I picture him on his knees beside her, sobbing. But hearing a creak of a floorboard behind me, my empathy is replaced by fear as a knot forms in my throat, 
and I spin to see James approach. James. Josephine, you made it, he sighs, walking towards me, shaking his head. He's wearing gray sweatpants and a heavy brown rain jacket. He looks older and more world-weary than he did when I knew him at the school, even though it wasn't that long ago, a year at most. I'm just about to say yes, obviously I made it. When he puts his hand into his pocket and pulls out a knife, and before I can move, slashes me across the forearm in a long, shallow cut. I gasp in shock and move to run, but he lunges at me. Screaming, I kick out, aiming for his balls, but he grabs my leg and twists, and I fall, hard, onto my side on the floor. Before I can move, he jumps astride me and pins me down, my face pressed into the dirty floorboards. James, what the hell? I shout, squirming, as he pulls my wounded arm back behind me painfully and sits silently, ignoring my shouts of retribution and efforts to dislodge him. Finally, just as I've started winding down my death threats and begin to try reasoning, I hear him let out a deep breath. Thank God, he sighs, springing off me and leaning down to offer me a hand up. Turning over, I bat his hand away and painfully rise, backing away from him, towards the door. Josephine, he raises empty hands to me, palms up, his voice coaxing. I'm sorry. I had to ensure you weren't kept, that you were not here on his behalf. What? I hold my arm tight to staunch the bleeding. It's not a deep cut, but it stings like a bitch. Your arm. He nods to where I hold it, blood just starting to seep through my fingers. If you were kept, you'd have healed instantaneously. Here. He pulls a bandage out of his pocket and advances towards me. Let me wrap it. Fuck off, James, I scowl, still backing towards the door as I tear the rest of my damaged sleeve off to use as a makeshift bandage. Josephine, for Christ's sake, he frowns. You've been living with a vampire for months. Cut me some slack. I scowl and take a deep breath. My rational brain understands his motives, but still, he hurt me. Just stay back, I snap, and explain how you're going to rescue me. Here, he withdraws the knife from his pocket and places it on the floor in front of him, backing away. If it'll make you feel safer, keep this. I nod and, not taking my eyes off him, pick up the knife. Come on, let's find a place to sit, he motions. Not here. I shake my head, leaving the parlor and turning to walk further down the hall. If Nicholas's journal is correct... I know we'll come to a small sitting room fronting the back garden, and I'm relieved when I find I'm right. Here? I point to the deep rock windowsill overlooking a walled garden now overgrown with weeds, the window long bereft of glass. He nods and sits on the ledge, and I follow suit, still keeping a healthy distance between us as I press the sleeve material to the cut on my arm. I'm not here to rescue you, Josephine, he says getting straight to the point. What? I'm here to ask for your help, he sighs. Jesus, James, are you for real? I know this might sound strange. He holds up his hands in supplication. But I don't let him finish. You used me as live bait for a goddamned vampire, James. You cut me. You owe me a rescue. That was before, he whispers. Before what? before you agreed to join us, to go with Lucy. Lucy. I roll my eyes and spit the words. Had her head popped off and her face peeled. Not in a beauty salon kind of way, if you get my drift. I stop when I hear his sharp intake of breath. James, I'm sorry. I add softly. I forgot you're related. She was my twin sister, he says quietly taking his eyes from me and gazing out to the garden beyond. I feel terrible, horrible that I've told him how she died in such a graphic and heartless way. I'm so sorry, James. She never said. She called me the night she died. He swallows hard, and I watch his Adam's apple bob up and down. 
She said you were going to go with her, to help us catch the ancient vampire. Yes, I nod. I need you to help me do that, Josephine. Yeah? Well, I need you to get me the hell away from here. He shakes his head. Fucking hell, James. Why not? His eyes turn deadly. Because the way to free you, and all of us forever from the tyranny of these monsters, the key to their destruction, is in those journals, in that library. You think the journals will say who this father or mother of all vampires is? I shake my head doubtfully. Yes. He nods. And when you find out, then what? Then my hunters and I will find the ancient and destroy him, or her. And then? Then all vampires on Earth will die, instantaneously. I gasp. All? Our lore suggests every, single, one. He enunciates each word precisely, in a deadly tone. Then I'll be free, I muse, frowning as my heart constricts at the thought of Nicholas dying. Yes, he smiles. Have you killed vampires before, James? My mind swings back to the kitchen and Monsieur Contel's words, books don't teach execution. He nods. Yes. So you want me to read all his journals and find this name? He nods again. James, how is it that you and your sister have vampire blood in your systems? I told you. He squirms uncomfortably. We drain a vampire and gain their strength. I don't believe you. I stare at him. Because Lucy said you needed top-ups if you were injured horribly. But it seems to me that she, and you, since you're related, were born as hunters. He stares at me, saying nothing. I want to know how hunters were originally made. That's not something I can share with you, Josephine. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. I rise, preparing to leave. Wait. He closes his eyes, looking pained. Okay, but you can't share this with anyone, ever. It's a closely guarded secret. It's part of Hunter lore. Just spit it out, James. Did Lucy tell you that Elspeth made all hunters? No, I found that out for myself reading the journals. He considers me carefully for a moment. Well, what those particular journals don't say, what I'm not even sure Lord Montague knows, is that the very first hunter was Elspeth's own son, Alexander. What? I know my voice sounds hushed and shocked, and I sit down promptly. Her son, her only child, he goes on. She gave him her blood when she learned he was to go to war against the French. She was worried he would die, so she had him drink a glass of her blood. But when he returned, she enlisted him to help her destroy her vampire enemies. Holy shit, I breathe. And then what? She made more and more? No. He shakes his head. The bloodline continued. Our family are descendants of hers. All other hunters were made by us. You see, she was a manipulator par excellence. Some of her family down the ages she favored, but others who didn't do her bidding, didn't choose the wives she suggested, or do as she recommended politically. She turned against her. Eventually, the two sides of the family diverged. One side continued to serve, while one, the Lanesboro side, actively worked to destroy her and every vampire they could find. The children who were not born with her vampire blood in their genes were enabled to continue as hunters by catching and draining other vampires. My family aimed to destroy all vampires, but our numbers dwindle every year through vampire predation and low birth rates, so we've switched from just hunting individuals to hunting one individual who holds the key to all of them. How do you know this super vampire even exists? I wonder out loud. Because vampires are not the only ones who keep journals, he says quietly. And Elspeth's son was a diligent correspondent. So, the pen really is mightier than the sword in the end, I muse. Yes, he laughs quietly. Just so you know, there's no way I can read all Lord Montague's journals in my lifetime. He's written one every year for the past five centuries. I frown, 
filing away the information about James's family for future consideration. And just how do you propose I get into his library, which I'm sure I don't need to tell you, is locked. Josephine. He tilts his head to one side and smiles at me. You've been living under this vampire's roof for months, yet he hasn't turned you into his kept. He has feelings for you. Use them. Feelings. I roll the word around on my tongue for a moment. Yes, I suppose he does. As I think this, I acknowledge quite suddenly and uncomfortably that I have feelings for Nicholas too. Yes, feelings, James says, bringing me back to the moment. So use them, or your body, or whatever it is he's enjoying right now, to get him to trust you and allow you to read his journals. My body? I'm not a whore, James. I know. He slaps his thigh in frustration, making me jump. But do you want your freedom? Or do you want to be running for the rest of your life, forever looking behind you in the knowledge that one day, or one night, he will find you? I shudder and rise. He's right. I need to end this. I'll try. I sigh, handing him back his knife and wincing at the pain in my arm. But if I can't get access to them within a fortnight, all bets are off. I want you to extract me, or whatever the hell the army term is for pulling out a soldier. I'll help you in another way, but I can't live there any longer. Agreed. He smiles, letting out a deep breath. In the meantime, I'll meet you here next Friday and see how you're going. It'll have to be at night. I had a hell of a time getting in here today unnoticed, and I don't fancy my chances of getting away with it too often. Well, I usually have dinner with Nicholas from 9 p.m. until around 11 p.m. each night, I frown. Shall we say midnight? See you then. I nod and leave without a backward glance. Today was not as I had expected, and I'm disappointed that I have to return, or most of me is. A very small part is glad. I decide on the spur of the moment to make a detour before I go back to the manor. I want to enjoy some late afternoon sunshine, or at the very least, fresh air. Winter's almost upon us, and the rain is intermittent most days. Today's cold and overcast, but dry, like the last gasp of autumn, and I make my way to the small cemetery and sit beside Constance's grave. Absent-mindedly, I pick a handful of the season's last forget-me-nots and place them near her headstone, as I had so many months ago when I first visited Ariston. I see why you loved him, I say quietly to her. He has a gentle side, a thoughtful side, that's hard to resist. I don't know how you didn't fuck him on your wedding night, though. I laugh. I mean, whoa, let's face it, Constance, he's pretty irresistible. As I say this, I shake my head. Hadn't I just agreed to a plan to murder said irresistible bastard? I smirk and straighten up, wondering what a pious young woman might think about my language and my take on a man she once called husband. But as I do, I feel the hairs on the back of my neck rise, and I spin to look at the nearby dark woods. I feel as though I'm being watched, and some primal, basic part of me knows I'm in danger. I wonder, vaguely, if there's anything dangerous in English woods, but decide since I'd never heard of a bear or wolf attack in this country, the most dangerous thing is probably man. Or, I snigger, vampire. I narrow my eyes and wonder if that's exactly what's watching me. Nicholas, if that's you, cut it out. Come out. You can see I'm not running anywhere. I hear a crackle in the underbrush and strain my eyes, but see nothing. Okay, if that's how you want to play it, you psycho. Frowning at the waning light, I turn and make my way towards Ariston Manor the long way round, so I'm not anywhere near the trees. All the way back I rehearse ripping him a new asshole when I see him tonight for trying to frighten me, and succeeding, and for spying on me. Finally, around 5 p.m., just as twilight wanes into darkness, I stomp up the front stairs and into the entry foyer, and come face to face with my captor. He's lounging on the bottom step of the grand staircase, as though he's been waiting for me all along. 
Did you have an enjoyable walk? As if you didn't know, I spit. You don't need to spy on me. I can hardly run anywhere when you've got your fucking gamekeeper ready and willing to blow my brains out. I can barely keep the venom from my voice, the memory of the night before, of his teasing and ultimately his rejection still fresh in my mind. He frowns. What are you talking about? You, watching me from the woods. Don't try and deny it. I sensed you. Josephine, I have not left the house this day. Sure, I sneer, turning from him. Wait. I pause but don't turn back. It might be best if you don't venture out on twilight into my grounds. I'm not the only vampire in the world, Josephine. Are you saying another blood-sucking freak might be lurking on your estate? Trespassing on your precious Ariston? I doubt it very much. But if you're serious in your feeling that someone was watching you, I need to investigate. You just don't want me leaving this fucking haunted house. I turn and angrily gesture around us at the portraits on the walls, before walking away once more. His shout stops me in my tracks. Josephine, that's not true. Stop! Why do I smell blood on you? I shrug as I watch him scrutinize me from top to toe, glossing over my legs but pausing and catching his breath when he sees the fabric wrapped around my forearm. He's beside me before I can blink, lifting my arm and removing the makeshift bandage. Ouch. Careful. I try to pull my arm from his grip, but it's vice-like, and he lets out a low growl. What happened? I shrug. I fell. It's nothing. It's not nothing, Josephine. He raises his eyes to mine, his voice gentler now. Burns, cuts, scrapes. I may need to keep a nurse in situ all year round if this continues. I snort and try to pull away. No, you don't. Come with me. Where? He doesn't answer, instead pulling me towards a nearby powder room where he motions for me to sit on a long marble bench running the length of one wall as he begins opening cupboard after cupboard until he finds what he's looking for. Returning to me, he holds up a bandage and a tube of cream. Now be brave. This might sting. I shake my head in wonder, watching his beautiful head bent over my arm as he carefully cleans my cut, disinfects it, and binds it tightly with the bandage. It's not too deep. Doesn't require stitches. He looks up, meeting my eyes and I blush. He raises one sardonic eyebrow. What? Nothing. He smirks. You clearly have something on your mind, Josephine. Your eyes are very expressive. I shrug. I was just wondering how someone so bloodthirsty can be so gentle. A butcher's wife might ask the same of her husband. How can he kill animals every day, all day, and then bounce his baby on his knee at night? Except you don't butcher animals, and I'm not a baby. He frowns and turns from me. In some matters you are. I scowl and hop up from the bench, turning to leave. Will I see you at dinner? I turn, surprised, and notice the hesitancy in his eyes. He obviously doesn't think so, given what happened last night. But strangely, it hasn't crossed my mind that we wouldn't dine together, as we do every night. Of course. Seeing the relief in his expression, I turn away, my face once more flaming, although I don't know why. Chapter 12 I wander along the hallway, studying each one of the former Lady Montagues. They're all similar in that they're perfectly coiffured, beautifully dressed, and lovely to look at. For two weeks now, I've lounged in jeans and t-shirts, albeit designer, and read Nicholas's journals. He was quite willing to allow me to read them when I broached the subject at dinner after my first walk outside. I'm not sure if it was because I hadn't tried to run, or if he was feeling guilty about our bed antics, but his answer shocked me. If this is what you need to truly understand the depth of my feelings for you, and to understand how I live, then by all means, Josephine, read my journals. By the way, I've taken the liberty of ordering some clothes for you. They'll arrive tomorrow. I left the dining room that evening stunned, and for the first time, 
without a kiss to either my hands or my lips and feeling somehow empty. All fortnight I've read the journals and learned nothing about any super vampire. I don't know what James expects. Maybe a Darth Vader kind of moment where some creepy old vampire jumps out and says, Nicholas, I am your father. Or a subtle reference to the ancient. But I hadn't seen anything of either kind. When I told James, after the first week, that my search was fruitless, he suggested I widen my net and read every fourth or fifth journal, rather than perusing them in order. I've been doing that since, but so far they're all very similar. Nicholas had traveled, killed, hunted the hunters, married here and there, and kept lovers sporadically. It was this last matter that interested me the most, as I read his accounts of how he met them, what they were like, what they did together. He sounded dispassionate in his recounts, almost distanced, as though he had a wall around himself that couldn't be breached, no matter how intelligent or talented or attractive they were. I can't help but acknowledge that his attitude to me is very different. But as for reference to another vampire, an all-powerful creature of the night, as I told James, it was a no-show. Keep reading, he told me when I met him last week. I know the secret's close. Just how do you plan on killing some super vampire anyway, James? You haven't confided any of their weaknesses to me. I know they can't go into the sunlight, but do they melt? Does silver harm them? I know they don't like milk. What happens if they get it on them? He stared at me. I could see he was calculating how much to share. But finally, he shrugged and pulled from his boot a long silver blade. It wasn't shaped like any knife I've ever seen. In fact, if I had to guess I'd say it looked like a cross between a trowel and a cake server, albeit with a metal handle. Handing it to me wordlessly, he nodded to me to take it. As I held it, I could feel its weight. Its appearance was deceptive. Its edge, too, while appearing dull, was razor sharp. And all over it, strange rune-like symbols had been etched in a lighter, golden-colored metal. Is it silver? No, we don't know what metal it is, or where it came from, he'd murmured. How did you get it? It was buried with Alexander. You dug him up? I didn't. Other hunters did, a long time ago. This weapon was given to him to hide and protect for eternity, stolen apparently from the original vampire. Legend says it's the only thing that will kill him or her. Huh. I handed the weapon back and watched as he resheathed it in his boot. I haven't forgotten our deal, Josephine, he said, looking back up at me once he'd secured the weapon. One more week, and if you haven't found anything, we'll get you out of here. I nodded then and left. That week was up tonight. Usually when my eyes tired from reading the journals, I'd take a walk around the newly established gardens to get some fresh air and a little rain, or fog, or snowfall, before returning to cook, and later, dress for dinner. My days and nights at Ariston have begun to feel like a comfortable blanket, one that no longer chafes or itches quite so much, perhaps because I know I won't be under it for much longer. But today, I hadn't taken a walk. It was snowing quite heavily, so instead, I was busy putting faces to names in the Hall of Portraits for all the former Lady Montagues. And there were many. I wonder idly if he has pictures somewhere of all the women he's kept over the years. But decide? Probably not. I'm so intent on studying their faces, I don't realize I'm also being studied. Turning, I frown as I see Nicholas leaning casually against the wall opposite. He's dressed in jodhpurs and a tight white polo shirt, unbuttoned casually at the neck, a glimpse of his chest, just visible. I know that now the days are shorter, and his new outdoor lights have been installed. He's been enjoying riding in the early evenings and nights. Horses don't interest me, but him in jodhpurs and knee-high leather boots? Whoa. My breath hitches in my throat at the sight of him, but I try to act nonchalant. You seem very intent on your study. They all look the same, I shrug, like little Barbie dolls, all lined up, one after the other. He says nothing, 
and I turn back to the paintings. How did you meet them all? I wonder out loud, as I continue my slow traverse down the hall, past portrait after portrait. Gerald, mostly. I don't go out of my way to find women, but Gerald has a very active social life. Don't you think that's strange? I turn to him, frowning. That Gerald introduced you to all your past wives? No, not really. Like I said, I don't socialize much. His expression belies his words, and I can see that now I've mentioned it, he's considering the matter. And you never loved any of them, I muse, turning back to the portraits and shaking my head sadly. It was a statement, more than a question. I already know the answer. No. Maybe if you had found one yourself, you might have fallen in love, rather than taking Gerald's recommendations. Maybe I simply needed to drop my journal in a park. He raises his beautiful eyes to mine as I turn to look at him. I blush and quickly turn back to the portraits. He'll be here this week. Tomorrow, most likely. Who? Gerald. And with him will come someone I am sure you will be happy to see. Margarita! I squeal, turning to him and smiling in delight, his own face mirroring mine. Why didn't you tell me? I just did. I can't take the smile from my face. I know she's a zombie now, but she'll always be my margarita. Knowing, though, that she'll arrive tomorrow, I try to conceal my disappointment. I plan to leave with James tonight. A very small part of me wonders if I should postpone my escape, try to convince her to run away with me. But I know there really isn't any point. I know she won't come. She loves her vampire. Even as I think this, my chest constricts. I'll miss Nicholas. Watching the play of emotions across my face, he steps close to me. What's wrong? I, ugh, nothing. I step away and turn back to the portraits. Josephine. He's standing so close to me I can smell his delicious breath, the hair on my arms prickling and my skin goose-bumping as it always does at his proximity. I glance at him out of the corner of my eye and see him watching me, carefully, his own breath coming faster. Before I can second-guess myself, I turn and allow him to gather me into his arms. His kiss is deep and soft and intense, and our tongues meet and explore as he gently presses me against the wall. Even as he does so, and I know I'm leaning against the portrait of a former wife, someone he killed, I can't stop kissing him. I twine my fingers into the hair at the back of his head, pulling him closer, urging his tongue deeper. Groaning, he pushes harder against me, and I feel his arousal and moan in response as his hands move, one to my backside, pulling me in tightly against him, the other to my breast, cupping, squeezing, driving me wild. I move my hands from his hair and run them down his spine and up under his shirt, feeling the skin of his back, the hard, ropey muscles leading down to his firm ass. But as my hands wander lower and I pull him to me, he groans and pulls away, launching himself to the wall on the other side of the hall, staring at me, panting. I stare back, my hair and clothes in disarray, my face flaming. Why? I mutter. Why do you pull away from me? Is this some kind of game to you? He groans. Josephine, I want you. I want you too, I admit, lowering my eyes and blushing all the harder. Obviously. I just don't understand. I've told you I can't. I tried while I was in London last. I can't. You tried what? I tried to... He waves his hands in the air. Without biting. Sex? Yes. You tried to have sex with someone in London without biting them, and you couldn't. He nods. My face flames again, this time in anger as jealousy courses through my veins. The thought of him, just a few weeks ago, in bed with another woman, makes me crazy as hell. Jesus Christ, Nicholas. I thought you went to hunt. I did but I also wanted to see if there was a way, any way, that I could give you what you want. 
What I want? I stare at him, confusion all over my face. Yes. You said you didn't want me to bite you, didn't want to be my kept. I thought there might be a way for us to be together without that. He runs his hands through his hair in frustration. But there isn't, and I can't keep my hands off you. I can't see any way forward with you. Or without you, Josephine. And it's driving me fucking crazy. Oh. Yes, oh. He sighs, turning and striding down the hall without a backward glance. I watch him leave, my eyes wide. I'd never heard him swear outside his journals before. Never seen his veneer of calm dominance and confidence slip. He wants a relationship even without biting? Is that something I would want too? Yes, no, yes, I don't know. I shake my head at my indecision. The bottom line is, he has to bite. And no matter how attractive I find him, how much I like him and want him, I also want a future. A future where I marry, have sex with someone who doesn't want to eat me, have babies, grow old. No biting. And you can't give me that, Lord Montague. I make my way to my room to, once more, pack my books. And wait. Later, after what seems like an interminable time, where the minutes had trickled along like cold honey off a wooden spoon, I leave. It's midnight. I sent a note to Nicholas this evening, via the very reluctant butler, that I had a headache and couldn't dine with him. In truth, I don't have a headache. I just couldn't face sitting opposite him, making conversation, knowing that it was the last time I would ever do that. I think we said our goodbyes today in the Hall of Portraits. I'm sure when he thinks back, he'll realize that too. I shake my head at the thought of his reaction when he learns I've left. Will he just let me go? Surely he can see it's best for both of us. After all, he said he could see no way forward. I try to suppress my sorrow at the thought of never seeing him again. I know I'm falling in love with him. I've known, if I'm honest, for a while now. I have to leave. It's now or never. Skirting along the edge of the field past the cemetery, keeping one eye on the woods to my right, I can just see by the very faint moonlight peeping out through the heavy cloud cover and illuminating the snow-covered path before me. I have a small torch, but I don't plan on using it unless I must, in case I draw someone's attention. I'm not sure if the gamekeeper is on duty at night, but it wouldn't surprise me. Seeing Constance's manner up ahead, I frown as I draw closer, noting the door is wide open. James is usually more careful, and I wonder if he's hoping I'm being followed so he can try to kill Nicholas, or, the hairs on the back of my neck rise, something's gone wrong. As I mount the step to the front door and gingerly push it open, I smell something disgusting and wrinkle my nose in distaste. James, I whisper, loud enough for him to hear if he's in the parlor, but not loud enough for anyone outside the building to notice. There's no answer, and I squint and step into the pitch black hall, almost instantly tripping over something lying in front of me. Falling to my knees onto the hard floorboards, I gasp and pull my hands up, fumbling for my torch in my jacket pocket, my hands sticky. They smell like shit, human shit. Whining, a small high-pitched sound that escapes my throat despite my best intentions, I flick on the torch and shriek. Before me, the long hallway is strewn with body parts. Bits and pieces of James lie the length and breadth of the floorboards. I note with horror that I'm kneeling amongst intestines and organs, and that I've tripped over a foot. His head, lying a meter or so down the hall, has been entirely skinned, and every muscle is visible. His teeth, bared, stand out like roadside markers against my torchlight. His eyes bulge in their sockets. Breath coming in sharp, jagged hitches, I scramble back towards the door like a crab, my eyes momentarily pausing their frantic roaming of the dim hallway when they alight on a glimmer of silver. It's James's boot, his shin bone protruding from the top, and alongside that, the weapon that he showed me the last time we met. 
I shake my head back and forth like a maniac as panic and indecision cause me to freeze, my thoughts colliding. Get the hell out of here, leave it. No, go back and get it. It's within arm's reach. No, run. Don't be a fucking idiot. Finally, my idiot brain wins over my rational brain, and I scoot forward, pull the blade from his boot and slip it into my own. But just as I do this, preparing to scoot once more for the front door and run like hell. My sixth sense makes me look up, all the way to the end of the corridor, where standing, staring at me, is a woman in a long black cloak. You must be Josephine, she hisses through long fangs as she launches herself towards me faster than anything I have ever seen. This time there's no mistake, she snarls. And it comes to me then, as her face looms into view, and I recognize her for who and what she is, that this will be the last thing I will ever see. Chapter 13 I come around slowly. I'm alive, or so it seems. The familiar cherubs cavort above me, and to my left sits my vampire, head in hands. I wriggle my toes and mentally scan my body. I feel well, very well, actually. Nothing hurts at all, even the never-ending dull ache at the back of my head since my fall down the stairs in Sicily has disappeared. How can this be? Oh no. Elsbeth killed me, I whisper, as his head jerks up in response to my words, and he grasps my hands firmly. She said you were not permitted love. She killed me. No. He shakes his head, his voice hushed. Almost. He swallows hard, and I sense bad news is coming. Very bad news. You lost so much blood. He looks down to where his hands enfold mine, his words now just a whisper. I had no choice. I'm a vampire? I squeak, my voice coming out as a half a sob. He shakes his head. No. I'm kept? He nods as I pull my hands from his and cry out. I can't control my tears, and I sob loudly, uncontrollably, my cries containing all the horror, fear, and pain of the last twelve months, encapsulating my sorrow over the future I will no longer have. All the running, all the planning and subterfuge, all the deaths, everything had been for nothing. The whole time I cry, several minutes, he sits on the chair near the bed like a statue, his face a mask of grief, watching me, until finally, my sobs reduce to hiccups, and I feel the bed dip as he sits down beside me and strokes my hair. I will set you free, Josephine. You don't have to fear my bite. You don't have to stay with me against your will. You will live a long, healthy life, anywhere you wish, doing anything you wish, as far from me as you wish. I just want you to be happy. I wanted children, I whisper, a daughter to pass my recipes on to, someone to love. You have someone to love. His face radiates sorrow as I shake my head. But you can have others. Children, Josephine, that path is not closed to you. I sniff and look up at him, wiping my nose on my sleeve. What? The kept can still have children. He looks down at the blanket picking at a stray silk thread with his beautiful long fingers. Just not with their masters. So, vampires can't have babies, but I can? With a human man, yes. Of course. I breathe out a sigh of relief. Otherwise the Lanesboroughs wouldn't exist. Pardon? He raises his eyes to mine. The Lanesboroughs are descendants of Elsbeth's. Her blood runs through their veins but that side of the family rebelled against her, against all vampires. They have babies, but every now and again, a child is born with the hunter blood in their genes, like James and Lucy. He frowns. I knew the Lanesboroughs were hereditary hunters, but I had no idea it was Elsbeth's blood. His face turns thunderous as he mentions her name. How could you not? I frown. She told you when you tried to have a hunter stake her in the 1500s that she made them. Yes, but she didn't say she was related to them. 
She knew my name, I whisper. How did she know my name? I don't know. He shakes his head. Can she feel, you know, what you feel? No. That ended when I turned vampire. How did you find me? How did you save me? His reply is barely a whisper. I didn't save you. And I didn't find you. She came here, to the house, gloating that she had destroyed you. I found you. His breath hitches and I watch him pause, trying to rein in his emotion. I found you where she said I would, laid out in the parlor, exactly as Constance had been. I thought you were dead, Josephine. I... He stops, shaking his head and dropping it once more into his hands, his next words muffled. I never knew pain until that moment. I sit still, thinking through his words, seeing for the first time his depth of feeling for me. He really does care for me. She's going to kill me, properly kill me, when she learns I'm your kept. I will destroy her. His eyes radiate murder as they meet mine. You need not fear her. She will not walk this earth much longer. I gulp and nod. He is truly terrifying when he wants to be. Yes, you should do that, I whisper, squeezing his hands and bringing him back to the now. If you can. I'm older and more powerful than I have ever been. He rubs his thumb across my knuckles as he speaks. It won't be easy, but it will be a pleasure like no other. I frown, and he looks up, remembering who he's speaking to. I want to help you. I breathe. I want to kill her for what she's done to you. And to me. To us. I add the last word almost in a whisper. He shakes his head but smiles, trying to lighten the mood. While we're on the subject, what is this? He leans down beneath the bed and pulls out the silver-patterned knife, and my eyes widen. I'd almost died retrieving this. It belonged to James. I shake my head to get out the images that flash in my brain, his broken body, his eyes bulging out of his skinless red skull. It's an ancient relic. Apparently it'll kill Vader Vampire, the father or mother of all vampires. It was given to Elspeth's son for safekeeping and hidden in the family. Vader Vampire? He raises an eyebrow. It's just how I think of him. James believes there's one super vamp, and that if that vampire's stabbed with this silver or platinum or whatever it is weapon, all vampires will die. Nicholas frowns down at the knife, but handles it, I think, a little more gingerly. Well, we can't know if this is true or not. He raises his eyes once more to mine, sending a thrill through me with their intensity, and stands, but I hold his hand tightly. I know I'll want children in the future, perhaps when I'm thirty or so, but knowing I do have a future, that he'll set me free, suddenly makes me realize that I don't want to go, not for now, at least. Nicholas. Smiling sadly, he leans down and presses his lips gently to mine, as he did the very first time he kissed me. Desire flames in my belly, desire and a need for him, stronger than I've ever felt, and I reach up and wrap my arms around his neck. But he pulls away. Josephine, no. You said you could feel what I feel, once I had your blood, I whisper, looking up at him, my hands on his shoulders, my eyes meeting his. What do you feel, Nicholas? He stares at me, blanching, his eyes searching my face, his words just a whisper. You love me. I think I do, I murmur. Does this mean you'll kill me now, my vampire master? I'm not your master. He shakes his head, his eyes full of pain. I am your slave. With an intensity I've only dreamed of, he grips my head in his hands and claims my lips, and I drag him onto the bed, onto me. Matching his force with my own, I pull his shirt apart,
making his buttons pop off just as he did my dress so many nights ago. My body afire with need for him. Wait, wait. He pulls away from me as I growl, holding him tight. I will bite you. What? I still, the world coming back into focus. When we, when we make love. He closes his eyes briefly before looking back down into mine. I will bite. I frown at him. I don't want that, even now. Even with lust taking over every other rational thought, this one is crystal clear, especially after Elsbeth's bite. It hurt like hell. I hated it. I never want to be bitten like that again. My silence speaks volumes, and he slowly rises from the bed and smiles gently at me, his eyes full of sorrow. What are we going to do? I whisper. He shakes his head and looks to the window. The dawn is upon us. He has to go. And I know now. So do I. Dine with me tonight? His voice is gentle, lost. One last time. I nod, tears beginning to slip down my cheeks. The End Josephine's story continues in Kept, The Lost Vampire Journals Book 4. Available on Amazon. Hit subscribe to hear the audio on YouTube.